tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. She won't stop talking about the Mothman. Dad's voice was wispy through the wind rushing past the car, and I had to lean closer to the phone to hear him. Just let her talk about it. She thinks that she saw him. She gets upset if you don't let her talk about it. Yeah, that's no problem, I responded. It wasn't the first time Nana had mentioned the Mothman to me, I wanted to say. But instead, I said, have a good day. Love you. Love you too. And thank you again for looking over her today. Papa should be back around six. What time will you be back? Not until tomorrow morning. I'm spending the night in North Carolina. I'm finishing my client's will and he wants to meet in person. We probably won't be finished until late tonight, and then I'll drive back home tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. Bye. Bye. There were only two other people on the roads this early, and I allowed my grip on the steering wheel to lessen. When the phone clicked off and the muffled sounds of the radio came through, I began to mumble along to the song they were playing. It was the same pop song, something that the radio had played five times this week, and I never cared to learn who sang it. It was catchy enough, though, for me to know the words. The roads meandered through the mountains, leading up to Papa and Nana's house, and I fell against the sides of my seat as I took them in. As the roads straightened out and I approached their driveway, I saw that Papa's white Honda was not in the open garage. Why did he leave before I came here? Did he lock the doors? I took a deep breath. He must have only left a few minutes ago and he left the garage door open for me. But what if she got out, I thought. It would only take Nana a few minutes to walk out of the house. I parked the car and looked around me. Could she already be outside, walking on the street? What if a car hit her? But the street was empty for as far as I could see. I ran to the house and turned the doorknob. It was unlocked. What if she walked down the hill and into the woods? Would I be able to find her then? When I opened the door, Precious started barking. Well, hi there, I said, and I put out my hand. She started to lick my palm. Is your mom home? Who are you? I heard Nana ask, and I turned to look at her. She was sitting on the couch in the living room beside the door. White dog fur clung to her black, fuzzy pajamas. Her eyebrows scrunched up together, and her eyelids drooped down as if she were half awake. I'm Kitty, your granddaughter, I said, and when her expression didn't change, I felt hollowness at the back of my throat. I gripped onto my phone, ready to call Dad or Papa or anyone. But then she smiled and gave a short laugh. She patted the spot beside her on the couch. Well, come here, baby. I moved to sit beside her, and Precious followed, sitting on Nana's lap when she had gotten settled. Do you need me to make you something for lunch? I asked but she gave another short laugh at that. No, honey, I'm okay. She grabbed onto my hand. My goodness, you've grown up? The last time I saw you, you were a baby. Nana, I saw you last month for your birthday. Oh, you did? She asked, and I nodded. Well, I don't remember that. Uh, how old am I? 72. Oh, wow, that's old. I don't feel like I'm 72. How old do you feel? 25. <laughs> she said and laughed. I tried to laugh with her, but I couldn't make myself form the sound. My shoulders moved up and down more than a laugh escaped from my lips. You know, I used to live up in Point Pleasant. She said and I nodded. I haven't been there in a long time though, but you know, they have the Mothman up there. They do? I questioned. It was better for her just to talk about it. She nodded like a child trying to convince her friend of a secret. I saw him for the first time when I was a little girl. I was out in the backyard playing with uh, Matthew. Where is Matthew now? He passed away, Nana. Oh, that's right. You know, he wasn't good at keeping up with things. There was something 
wrong up here, she said and pointed at her head. But he was the kindest person I've ever met. It's a shame we had to be taken away so young from this earth, but we must not question the good lord's ways. He and I saw the Mothman, though. He came down to see us when we played in the backyard. He looks more like a giant bird than a moth. You know, they had the radiation stuff up there in Point Pleasant. I think that a bird fell into a pile of that stuff, and the radiation caused it to grow too big. But I remember when he came to us, I held out my hand to him, and he let me pet his head. It was so soft, and then he just flew away, like that. A few days later, though, Matthew was gone. Where is Matthew? He passed away, Nana, when you were a kid. Oh, that's right, she said and patted my hand. He never really got sick, though. I just remember that he was there, and then he wasn't. I don't know what happened to him. I used to play in that backyard all of the time. I went out much farther than I was allowed to. I would climb up those hills, and I would always come back with my dresses in rags and my knees and palms cut and scarred. When my mama saw me, she would always yell. You know, she was so mean, but she was just worried about me. A simple smile grew across her face. I could be stubborn like that. I never listened to her. If I had listened to her and stopped climbing those hills, I wouldn't have seen the creature again. My favorite spot on those hills was a ledge that overlooked the bridge. I would sit on that ledge and watch the cars drive by and the coal miners walk back and forth to work. When I was sitting on that ledge one day, oh, it was so cold. I think it was in the morning, in the middle of September, and it was the first morning where it felt more like autumn than it did summer. I thought about returning home to get my sweater, but I had outgrown all of my old sweaters. The only one that fit was the one my mom had spent all summer knitting, and I didn't want to risk tearing it when I climbed those hills again. I made up my mind and decided that I would stay, and if I got sick, I would just try to hide my sickness from my mom. Only five minutes must have passed before he flew down beside me, and when he did, the air created from him flapping his wings almost knocked me off the ledge. But when he was settled... We sat and watched the cars drive by, the coal miners walk to work and back home. He let me pet his head like he did the first time. The air was starting to warm up, though, and I knew it was nearing lunchtime. If I missed my lunch, my mom would be very upset. So I waved goodbye to the creature, and he didn't seem to notice. And then I climbed down the hill and went back home. Later that night, we got a phone call. The bridge I was watching over had collapsed. My mom was crying, and I couldn't understand why. Children's minds just can't think of such destruction. It wasn't until I saw the bridge that I started crying too. Piles of rubble, that's all it was. And from then, I saw... Nana paused... Now, what did I see? I don't know, Nana. She smiled at me. Anyways, it doesn't matter now. What was I talking about? I thought for a moment about whether or not I wanted to tell her what she was talking about. It would be easier just to turn on a movie for her to watch. But it was better for her to talk about such things, to get it out of her system. I finally said, The Mothman. The Mothman? Yes, how you saw him before Matthew passed away, and how you saw him before the bridge collapsed. Oh, yes, I guess I did, didn't I? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I didn't think that the Mothman could leave Point Pleasant. That's his home, but I see him here sometimes. 
He likes to perch in the tree outside by the shed, and I see him when I'm in the upstairs bathroom. He's not there now, I know it, but he'll be there soon. I'm sure he will be, Nana. Would you like me to make you something for lunch now? I nodded. Oh, yes, dear. I'm very hungry. I got up and went to the kitchen next to the living room. There was an open bag of cardboard plates by a line of glasses with my Nana's red lipstick stains on them. There were plates stacked up in the sink, and fragments of the ketchup and mustard on them were mixing with the bubbles in the soap water. How hungry are you, Nana? Who said that? Uh, who are you? I stepped into the doorway leading to the kitchen. Do you know who I am? She smiled a tight-lipped smile at me. Yes, dear. You're my baby. Close enough, I thought. How hungry are you? She scrunched up her eyebrows like the question required some thought. Well, I think that I'm very hungry. Paper plates it is, then. I'll do the dishes later. What did you say? What do you want for lunch? Well, I think a cheeseburger and fries sounds good. I nodded and returned to the kitchen. When I opened up the fridge, I saw the box of frozen meat patties on the top shelf and a container of ice cream below it. There was only one meat patty left in the box. I fumbled for my phone and tapped Papa's contact. What if he doesn't want to talk right now? I hung up on the call. I can get groceries when he comes back if he doesn't want to get any. I used a pan that was already lying on the stove, and I placed the patty on it. I turned the dial, and a red light glowed on the electric blacktop. There was a faint sound of bells jingling in the distance. Did Papa bring toys out for Nana? I almost left it at that, but the muscles in the pit of my stomach tightened. It was the only logical conclusion that I could come up with. I walked back to the living room, and Nana and Precious were no longer on the couch. Nana? I yelled out. Silence. A rope of bells is tied to the doorknob on the door that connects the living room to the backyard. How does she remember how to unlock things? I could hear Precious's muffled barks as I ran to the door and opened it. Nana! I called out. All I saw were the grass and the rose bushes with their bare brown branches for a second. Then, her voice said, I'm right here, sweetie. The gazebo was behind me, and the memories with it. My bare feet were pattering on the planks, wishing against everything that I wouldn't get a splinter. My grandma, lying down on the reclining chair, the wind chimes blowing in the distance. Was it supposed to storm that day? I crawled beside her, and she said, Just listen. I would have never noticed it flying in the air. That's the thing. How could you never notice something that big flying into the air? But I just know I wouldn't have. It was meant to blend into its surroundings, but with its raven-like feathers fluffed against one another, each one longer than my grandmother's arms. I could see it now. Perhaps it only flew at night. What's wrong, dear? I opened my mouth, but there was only silence. All I could think was, it's supposed to have red eyes. Its eyes were only pupils, and there was a thin, pinkish-red line near its eyelids. Oh, baby, why are you staring like that? This is my... Well, I forgot what he is, but I've met him before. At least I feel like I have. I think he might be my guardian angel. The Lord works in mysterious ways. Look, he brought Matthew on his back with him. She pointed to where she saw Matthew, but there was nothing there. Only the dark feathers that glistened in the sunshine. Nana? And the word came out as nothing more than a whisper. Oh, hi, Matthew. Where did you go? Well, I'm your sister. Yes, it's been a long time, hasn't it? I can't seem to remember what happened to you. Well, okay, but why do you want me to tell her? Nana turned back to face me. If I happened to look in the backyard, I would think that the creature was nothing more than a Halloween decoration. Matthew wants me to tell you this because he says that you'll remember it for longer than I will. He wants me to tell you that... We were outside playing one day, and we were still children when he flew down beside us. Really? He let me pet him? Nana reached out her hand and started stroking the creature's side. 
The thing nuzzled against her. Yes, he is nice. No, you shut your mouth. Yes, I know. She turned back to look at me, still stroking the creature's side. Matthew saw the creature again that night. He didn't want to wake me up, and he was too scared to go out by himself, so he stared at the creature through the window. He must have stared for hours, but he started getting sleepy. He fell asleep lying to one side and knocked something off his nightstand. He turned to look at what had fallen, and then he turned to look out of the window. He wasn't there anymore. Matthew didn't go to sleep that night, and he saw him again on the second night. He stood out of his window for Matthew doesn't know how long, and Matthew couldn't stop staring at him. He was just slightly darker than the night around him. It must have been a few hours when he hadn't moved, and Matthew had just about convinced himself that it was all in his head. He turned away from his window and lay down in his bed. He had just shut his eyes when he heard scratching. The first thing that he looked at was the window, and his initial thought was that it was a tree branch scratching against the glass. He had convinced himself just enough to make him think that we had trees by the windows of our house. <laughs> he woke up on the third morning before the sun had risen into the sky. He opened the window as he did every morning, and that was when he saw the X carved into the glass. He heard the whistle of something breathing against the air, and he had just enough time to wonder if he had fallen asleep at all before the darkness folded around him. Then there was a bright light, and it took over everything, and... There was a beeping in the distance, and it was louder than Precious barking beside me. The creature, whose only previous movement had been blinking, spread its wings... Nana fell to the ground against the creature flapping its wings. When I joined her at her side, we both looked up to the sky, watching the creature fly past the clouds until he couldn't be seen anymore. What the hell is going on here? My papa screamed. He was already standing on the porch, but I didn't hear the door open. I came home and my whole kitchen is full of smoke. Are you trying to burn my house down? I tried to say I'm sorry, but my lips only formed the shapes of the words. And then, it was like Papa had walked out of the fog. He saw Nana and me lying on the ground, and he asked, What happened? Why are we outside? Nana asked at the same time. There was a creature outside here, Nana, I said and turned to face her. I think it was the Mothman. Silence from my grandfather, but I saw Nana smile. Oh, did he come to visit me? Oh, that's nice. You know, I didn't know that he could leave Point Pleasant. That's where he's from. But I see him so often now. He's not here right now, I know it. But he'll be back soon. Jesus! Papa exclaimed. You know, I want to tell you something, Nana said. I grew up in Point Pleasant, and I saw the Mothman. It's true. And then I was hoisted up into the air my grandfather's hands on my shoulders until I studied myself. You only had to listen to her, not play into her ideas. But he was here. We saw him. Who was here? Charlie, why are you so upset? Papa pressed the palms of his hands into his eyes, and I felt tears burn into the corners of my own. He opened his mouth and then closed it, deciding against whatever he was about to say. Take your Nana upstairs. She needs to rest. It would be good if you rested too. You're not fit to drive back home right now. I bit down on the inside of my cheek. I must sound so immature. Papa couldn't make eye contact with me as he passed Nana's hand to mine, and I started walking back inside the house. Why are we outside? She asked. I opened the door, and once we walked through, I watched as Papa continued to stare at the forest behind his yard. He didn't intend to move. I closed the door behind us. We saw the Mothman, I said to Nana, and I watched a faint smile form across her face. We did? You know, I've been seeing the Mothman a lot recently. I didn't know he could leave Point Pleasant. That's his home. But I see him a lot here. 
He's not here now, I know it. But he'll be back soon. Yes, Nana. I know. My name is Peter Squid Billy. Odd name, I'll give you that. Even stranger, as though a grown man north of 40 goes by a nickname. I prefer it, honestly. I not only make my friends and family call me Squid, but I also instruct my 100 or so colleagues above and beneath to call me that as well. My real name is Peter William. I know. I'm one of those shifty people with two first names. You can't trust them, right? Also, if you have paid attention to the first sentence of this paragraph, you are furrowing your eyebrows, maybe even lifting one, and scratching behind your left ear in inquiry. I said my name is Peter Squid Billy. It turns out my real name is Peter William. You probably don't know many people with the last name Billy. To easily explain this one, I'll just say that I hated my first name growing up. I hated William. When I was about seven or eight, I learned that some grown-ups called William can be called Billy. What a revelation. Like most boys my age, I was also into Old West outlaws and came across the legendary American train robber and vigilante Billy the Kid. What a combo at such an impressionable age. I started signing my name, Peter Billy. I introduced myself as such to my new class every school year, despite what was on the official roster. The name stuck to this day. Oh yes, the squid part. A unique name for a unique child. The short story is that when I was in third or fourth grade, I was playing with a black pen. I must have been trying to disassemble it like a Tommy gun or something, and the ink exploded all over my newly acquired Michigan Wolverine jersey I got for Christmas. It was a short-time college football phenom, Tim Biakabutka. He wore number 21. Doesn't sound like something too out of the ordinary for a child to wear. But it was their away jersey, if I remember correctly. Which means it was white. The black ink plastered the front of my chest like a Jackson Pollock painting. Hey, you a squid or something? One of my classmates yelled. And that was all it took. I was mortified at the time, of course. I knew I had to embrace it to keep the hurt down. I've been known as Squid ever since. I couldn't imagine not being Squid now. I love it. I hardly answer when someone calls me Pete, or Billy, or Mr. William. I'm Squid. Fast forward to the present day. I spend most of my days and nights in my corner office on the 10th floor of the Peterson Group building. 10 floors of controlling people's financial future. We're not a well-known company, like a shopping site or the search engine we all depend on. We do, however, know how to make money for our clients. I can't go further than that just because it's too hard to explain. I will say that recently we got ahead of the pack in the crypto world. An idea that a few of us agreed on could be major. Could we have been more correct? <laughs> Oh, and we also bought one of the first NFTs around, boosting that scam into the stratosphere. Did I say scam? I meant investment. I'm the CTO of this company, the chief tech officer. Basically, I'm the second in command. It's just a fancy term for social media manager. The boy in the ink-stained Wolverine jersey was always ahead of the crowd when the internet surfaced. Not only did I get it, but I also dove straight in. I learned to code. I made my own websites. I dominated the early days of e-trading, which brings me here today, sitting in a nice leather chair 
looking outside from over a hundred feet in the air. My life isn't great. It's not bad, either. I have no kids, no partner. I've dated and had a few serious relationships, but nothing committed. Things just didn't work in that department. I'm not one of those married-to-work guys. I just really do enjoy my job. I have a lot of freedom in that, which allows me to work whenever I want. A relationship can get in the way when I have an idea and need to flip my surface or laptop open. No one likes that when you're in the middle of watching a movie together. Sorry, I've rambled enough. I'm just excited to add this experience to my daily, monthly experience. It's a journal I've been keeping for a while. I read some billionaire keeps a journal of their best experiences to help them see in ink when they need reminding of what brought them to their success. I'm writing this with a real pen, a black pen. Hopefully it stays contained inside the hard plastic big container. Last night I was sitting at my desk, like most nights. I'm fortunate enough to have my bathroom, which is a plus. After finally deciding to power down my computers for the night, I decided to wash my face and piss in my bathroom. Not sure which order I performed that in. Either way, I shut the water off to the sink, flushed the toilet, and lost my vision. I was sitting in complete darkness. I could not see my hand in front of my face. I was not physically blind, thank the Lord. The power had gone out. I felt my way to the bathroom door, hoping that I would at least see the exit sign that always had the power to it by way of some kind of emergency regulated generator. Nothing. The building has lost power before, but never for more than a few seconds. We are situated in a part of the U.S. that doesn't have threatening weather or temps that would affect our electricity. As I was standing as still as a statue, feeling like a real shithead, I saw something black dripping from one of the air ducts. Yes, I know. It was pitch black. I don't understand if the area I was looking at was illuminated, or the lights had come on without me realizing it, or what. I truly believe what I saw was blacker than the darkness I was covered in. Being scared does not begin to convey how terrified I was. As I was transfixed on the multiple strands of black goo coming from the vent above me, I heard a voice. More like a cough. A clearing of the throat, maybe. Nervously, I worked up the fortitude to say something. Announce my presence. Hello? I said with a weak little voice. A ghostly moan responded. A dark and deep voice that bored inside my head. It felt like my eyes were going to shake outside of their sockets. Squid, I think it said. This couldn't be happening. I finally worked too much. I was seeing and hearing things due to overwhelming self-induced stress. After a moment, I bravely stood my mental ground. Who, who are you? What do you want? I put on my manliest front. No reply at first. Then after a few terrifying seconds, it responded. Hello, Peter. I attempted to reply to it, this time calmly. Look, I don't believe in ghosts or ghouls or ghasts. Who are you? What are you? I know it sounds strange, but I felt like it was thinking. I'm not here to scare you. I think you invited me. The lights came back on. Although not as bright as normal, I could at least see. The familiar office space was once again visible. I slowly made my way back to my leather chair. I cautiously sat down and I attempted to regain my composure. I did not see the black sludge. I didn't see a person or any kind of entity. But I felt it. Okay. What is your name? I heard what I perceived as a human voice saying, 
Um... And then silence. This time, the entity spoke again, as clear as a summer day in the Bahamas. You can call me Jim. Jim? I said quizzically. Um, yes. You can call me Jim. No one's asked my name before. I think I like Jim. For some reason, I was more relaxed now. Jim disarmed me with his joy at naming himself. Okay, Jim. What do you want? This was my first attempt at communicating with another world. A world I had no idea even existed. I'm here to help Pete. Or should I call you Squid? This thing knew my avatar, so that was an alarming start. It said that this spirit, demonic or not, knew exactly who I was. What do you want to help me with then, Jim? I was way outside of my comfort zone with this conversation. A few low clicking sounds, and then it spoke again. I know you were looking for more, even though you are a seemingly complete soul. You want more, but you don't know what. I looked around my office. A dozen awards for... nothing. Meaningless, cheap plastic statues were given to me for meaningless achievements. I can't even remember one of the occasions I've been acknowledged for. I still could not see anyone. As I said, though, I did feel it. Jim was with me in my office. It felt like he was sitting in his little invisible chair, knee to knee with me. At that moment, a faint, dark mist materialized around me. It took no form. The word ether was flashing in my brain. A low rumble indicated that Jim was about to speak again. Yes, I allowed you to see me for a brief moment, to show you that I do have somewhat of a physical form, which you humans appreciate. What's the phrase? Seeing is believing? I sat quietly. Right, on to business. I don't come to your realm often. Do you agree you are missing something, Squid? Of course, we all are, I said, feeling an immediate rush of sadness. You sit here surrounded by achievement. You are financially set forever, yet your dreams are all dead and buried. Do you know what happened to you? I felt something that has not happened to me in the better part of a decade. My lower lip started to move involuntarily. Vapors felt like they would escape from the corner of my eyes. Okay, okay. No need for that, Squid. I'll get to the end. Agree to let me in, and I guarantee you will find what you've been missing. I straightened up, loosened my tie, and leaned into where I imagined Jim would be. I'm in. The ether started swirling about me at a violent pace. My office now turned red. Say you agree, Jim said with much more bass in his voice this time. I stood now, kicking my chair to the ground in the process. I bet I looked silly. Jim had truly whipped his energy into a small tornado. It almost threw me face down on the floor. My attempt to bravely stand up to Jim turned out to make me look and feel weaker than ever. Say it, Squid. I agree. I was dropped on the floor of my office. I was in so much pain I didn't realize I was levitating from Jim's force. I grabbed my glasses, which were ripped off my face. I felt no more entity or ether in my office. Sensing this, I'm sure Jim appeared in front of me, an awful shadow version of a human. Two small white eyes were glowing where the head should be. He floated within six inches of my face. Three tendrils crept underneath my nose. Good. When I opened my eyes, I was in my bed. My bed, snug as a bug in a rug. 
It wasn't until after I brushed my teeth and opened the newspaper that I remembered what happened last night. Yes, I still read print. I laughed to myself. I think I need a vacation. I had some kind of mental break due to work stress. Hey Jim, are you watching me right now, you sicko? No response, as I anticipated. I think I'll take a walk to the corner store, get a little snack and a coffee. After I grabbed a grande mocha frap, I toured the candy aisle. I never make my way here. I've been on that keto kick for a while now. Today felt like a good day for a break. Ah, Reese's Cups. My childhood favorite. Take it. I spun around to see who the hell just spoke to me. The ghost. Still dealing with that adrenaline dump from last night. Oh no, Squid. I'm here. And I'm very real. No. I muttered. Yep. I'll be with you for a time, old Petey boy. Take the candy. Take the candy and walk out the door. What, not pay? It's like a buck fifty. I'm not going to steal a Reese's, man. If you could feel a little demon in your mind smile, well, that would be a weird thing to feel. I did, though. For absolutely no reason, I stared at that peanut butter cup now like it would change the rest of my life. I reached for it, hesitated, and started again. Now I'm walking out of the store with an unpaid package of candy in my sweatshirt pocket. I've never stolen a thing in my life. I'm not a thief. It felt so... okay. It felt better than okay. I was on fire. If I had a health bar represented by little hearts, like Zelda, let's say that three out of five hearts were gone. I know there's probably more in the game. I haven't played since I was like six, so don't blow me up, okay? Follow me on the analogy. I have five hearts. Two are gone. When I stole that candy, one entire heart filled back up. Do you get me? I am sitting at home now. Staring at my looted prize. I just kind of smile. I don't know what I'm feeling, but I know that something has changed. Yes, child. You wanted to change, right? Oh shit. Him again. That was just step one, Squid. I think you're going to enjoy this new life of yours. Full of purpose. Full of excitement. Do as I say, and I will not disappoint you. By the time Jim ended his mini monologue, I had finished scarfing both peanut butter cups. It had been about six weeks since I became an adult kleptomaniac. I mean that sarcastically, of course. I have had no other urge to steal dollar candy. Nor have I had Jim in my head pushing me to do so. Jim hasn't been here at all. I've come to accept it. I think it's for the best. Standing in the subway, waiting for the 115 to uptown, I feel a familiar power brush by me. I know what it is immediately. Hello, Jim, I say through gritted teeth. Oh, come on, old boy. Don't be like that. This is customary. I give you an idea of what I do, then let you go back to your reality. Rolling my eyes out of my head, I stood up to face my abandoned spirit friend. So, what will it be then, Jim? Maybe you want me to steal a newspaper or something? I could feel Jim's energy change. You see that guy over there? When he said that, I felt a subtle breeze move across my face, like a hand attempting to move my head in a certain direction. As I moved my gaze, I saw a person... It was just him and me down there. This time of day isn't that busy, but there are usually more than two people. Yeah, that's him. Hey, you want to push him onto the train tracks? What? Fuck you, man. Not a chance. I'm not a murderer. The man looked at me. I forget that I'm arguing with thin air with everyone else. As soon as he made eye contact with me, he quickly went to minding his own business. Jim seeped back into my brain. 
Maybe the train will be early. Maybe it'll be late. Maybe you'll make it off the tracks in time. You don't know, Squid. That's the fun of it. Haven't we been over this before? Push him. No. Do it. Or you will not be happy. I started to make my way over to the stranger. I attempted to be non-conspicuous, but kind of hard when there was no crowd. I stopped when I was about ten feet away. You do it, I said. I expected another cosmic response about how I was supposed to be fulfilled by acts of random badness. But instead, I heard only five words. I thought you'd never ask. Without a second to process, I saw the man get yanked off the platform to the tracks below. I could physically see his brown jacket go up behind his neck like someone was pulling it. And then, his arms and legs whipped behind his torso like he was being pushed in the back with major force. I watched the soon-to-be corpse scrounge to his hams and knees, eyes as wide as dinner plates. Don't help him. I was mid-stride and it stopped. He's right. This is all happening for some reason. A reason I cannot pretend to know. The man got to his feet. The familiar foghorn echoed through the steel and concrete tunnel. The massive headlight bent its fiery face. This only made the man more panicked. He met eyes with me. At that moment, I didn't feel sorrow or shame. I felt pity for a man who had no purpose in life. He should be there. He scrambled for the platform like his pants were full of ants. Ants in the pants. Let's go, Squid. Jim puffed in my ear. I was already on my way. Deciding to cancel my 115, I started walking up towards street level. Take one more look. As I did, I saw the man pull himself to safety. Sirens were sounding in the distance. Shit. I didn't think that the surveillance cameras were all over the place down there. Ah, no matter. I technically didn't do anything wrong. Can't charge me for not helping. I was afraid. The tracks were charged death traps. I didn't want to fall myself. Etc, etc. Sorry, it's been a while. It's been almost a year since I checked in with my journal. Jim and I have been besties. I don't want to go into everything. Maybe because I haven't been around. Not sure some of the things I've done should be repeated. Don't get me wrong, though. I've loved every second of it. Jim has let me do things as small as slap a little kid's hat off to as big as scamming some helpless grandma out of the little bit of life saving she had. Thanks for the subscription to Log Cabin Monthly. Jim was always right. I had a great life up to the point he met me, but I was missing something. Something I could not put my finger on. I think I'll enjoy a drink of my own creation. One part Jack Daniels Fire, one part Jim Beam Peach, and one part Butterscotch Schnapps. I call it the Sunday Fun Day. You can have it any day you like. Sip on one, then take a shower. There's no better way to end the day, in my opinion. As I wake the next day, I feel great. I throw on my favorite at-home loungewear, a gray champion sweatshirt and pants. I see the empty glass of Sunday Fun Day and smile. Should I keep the buzz going? No. Let's have a tall bottle of ice cold water and wait for Jim to tell me what's next. Speak of the devil, and he shall appear. Ah, Jim, I say to the ether. What do you have for me today? The lights flicker for a few seconds. Nothing, Squid. I laugh. Come on, man, I know you better than that. The mood lowers. We're done, Squid. You've reached the end of the line. A little rose filled with panic starts to bubble in my guts. Okay, stop messing around. What are we getting into? I'm not playing around. An audible laugh bursts through my eardrums. I was never playing around, Peter. 
the sweat beads on my forehead. Actually, I'm sweating all over. The sweatshirt seems like an intended choice. The specter that I've called Jim appears in front of me. Sit. At once, I'm thrown down into my dining room chair. Another chair comes flying towards me, stopping inches away. The black mist in the form of a human sits down in front of me, staring at me, knees to knees, face to face. I'm leaving you, Peter. You will be slung back into the life you knew before. I'm sure he picked up on the confusion in my face. It was fun, but you deserve to go back to your life as a sad, no-purpose-having meatbag. I'm having trouble breathing. I... I don't understand. I did everything you asked. I did awful things for you. I thought this was what I was supposed to do. Another cackle escapes the shadow person in front of me. This was always going to happen. You were supposed to change, adapt, see how shitty of a person you were. Instead, you embraced it. I was only there to push you hoping you'd go the way I wanted. And you did. Sorry, you were an insignificant pawn in this ethereal game. I tried to speak, but nothing was coming out. Think about it, Peter. The only thing you've hung on to your entire pathetic life is that stupid nickname. You never made a difference. You never helped anyone. You didn't hold doors open for anyone. You scammed people out of their hard-earned money. You sold them terrible investments. You even took a little off the top. Your boss has just found out the extent of your theft. Even worse, you regularly litter. My blood went cold. Sorry, Pete. I know this isn't how you thought this was going. I hoped it wouldn't go this way either, but here we are. It's been a pleasure, if that makes you feel any better. I always get high marks when my subjects don't bend. Best of luck to you. You're on your own again. I don't think you'll quite enjoy where it's going. Ta-ta. Wait, wait, I screamed. The only time I saw Jim's face, well, what looked like a face. It was mangled, glistening, and red. And like a campfire doused in water, it was gone. Silence. I wish the world would just explode. I had nothing to live for. I never considered this was a chance to change. I took the path far too traveled. This squid has been cooked. I met her on the internet, same way so many people do these days, sitting at the computer in my dad's one bedroom on a Friday night. He was snoring away in the other room, so I knew he had taken his pills. He slept like a rock on those things. Insomnia, he told me, but I knew the real reason he took them. He took them to escape, to leave the world he had created for himself. I also craved the escape, but my escape was video games. At least I wasn't plying myself with drugs. And outside of that, I was trying to change my reality. I knew there was someone else out there. Someone just like me. I was intent on finding her, and soon enough, I would. Dad would never approve of what I was doing. Internet dating, chat rooms, none of that would fly with him. That wasn't his way of doing things, and the way he saw it, his way was the only way. That was the ironic thing. Because the way he turned out, there was no chance I was following in his footsteps. In a sense, I was glad he drugged himself to sleep every night. It was my only chance to do this. I opened the browser and navigated to the dating site. Always with that nervous excitement when I went to check my messages. And when the screen finished loading, that dark, sinking feeling when there weren't any. Not one person interested out of the thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people on here. No one even compelled to tell my ugly ass to get lost. Nothing. Nothing at all. Typical. 
As usual, I spent a few minutes feeling sorry for myself, considered giving up the same way I always did. But I didn't give up. I took a deep breath and kept browsing for new profiles. It wasn't desperation, but fear that kept me going. My fear was quitting before my time came. Maybe just before my time came. Like walking away from a slot machine before the next guy hit the jackpot. This had to pay out eventually, even if I was the last guy on earth to find someone. Inevitably, the day would come. It was a waiting game. A numbers game. No different than the video games I love so much. As long as I kept playing, I was still in the game. Just keep at it, Kevin. There's someone else out there. All you gotta do is be here when she shows up. If you can't manage that, then you might as well be your dad. And I kept at it. It was always the thought of my dad that kept me going. A guy who did everything by the book. Who stayed out of trouble, went to Georgetown University, and earned a master's degree. Only to marry some narcissistic bitch who only cared about herself, mostly because she was as successful as him. And then to have it all fall apart on him. To lose his house, his family, and most of his money. The last thing I wanted was to be like him. Sometime later, while I was scrolling through the profiles in a hundred mile radius, a strange bead of light flitted across the screen. A green number one up by my inbox icon. A message. Someone had sent me a message. In real time. The idea of it was kind of embarrassing, like I wasn't supposed to see it so soon. Whoever had sent this was online this very moment. My mouse hovered over the icon. Should I click it? If I read it immediately, will she know? Would she think I'm a loser who spends his days and nights staring at his inbox? Or some kind of over-eager pervert? I checked my mail settings to see if there was a read-unread indicator for outgoing messages, but there didn't appear to be. Preparing myself for disappointment, I clicked on the mail icon and read the heading. Wanna talk? Read the subject line. The name of the sender was Trixie. I let out the long breath I'd been holding. Trixie. Had to be some kind of troll. Either that or some cam girl peddling her wares. But when I opened the message, it didn't look that way. It said, Kevin, you seem like a nice guy in your profile. Would you like to chat? If you do, please let me know. Trixie. I read the message several times over. I liked the part where she called me a nice guy mostly because I knew that was all I had to offer. If she had called me hot or sexy, I'd have known it was fake. But there was none of that. Nothing suggestive, no link to some weird streaming site. She seemed like a normal girl, just some girl who wanted to chat. Maybe he's someone just like me. Suddenly, I was less concerned with seeming overeager than I was with losing the chance to take her up on it. I hit reply, wrote, Trixie. I'd definitely like to chat. Thanks for reaching out. I'll be hanging around tonight, so hit me back if you're around. Kevin. I looked over the message, ultimately deleted the word definitely, and hit send. My heart was beating harder than normal. Had I acted impulsively? Maybe so. But a guy like me couldn't afford to miss any opportunities. Even Dad had cautioned me to keep my eyes open for opportunities. Although he had never approve of this one, the lesson still resonated. Sitting back in my chair and staring at my inbox notifications, it occurred to me I should check her profile. Bracing myself again for disappointment, I finally got up the courage to click on her icon. Trixie, age 18, appearance, white, slim-figured, brown hair, interests, reading, gaming, hanging with friends, seeking, nice, unselfish guy around my age. There was a picture of her, a kind of girl next door look, not unattractive, not exactly a bombshell. No complaints from me, I'd been called ugly enough to learn to be realistic. I hadn't even bothered to post my best photo for my profile pic. Why raise anyone's expectations? However this thing panned out, I'd rather she be pleasantly surprised when we met. Or at least not unpleasantly surprised. I can be naive at times, but I'm not unrealistic. I'm no catch. Nice, unselfish, sure, but that's about all I brought to the table. 
After rereading Trixie's profile, my inbox lit up again. Again with that lightheaded feeling, I clicked the icon, grinding my teeth at the sluggish connection. When the window finally loaded, I saw Trixie had replied. Hi, Kevin. So happy to meet you. I look forward to learning more about you, but could we chat somewhere else? Sending mail back and forth is totally awkward. I put a link below to a special chat site I use. If you could meet me there? My username is Trixie628. I'll be waiting. Trixie. My heart sunk at the mention of the external link. This was just what the cam girls did. Solicit you at a legitimate place, then drag you to whatever site they were affiliated with to set up an account and start sending them money. Then again, none of those girls used such plain pictures for their profile photos. Aside from the fact that she wanted to chat somewhere else, there wasn't much to be suspicious of. Should I give it a chance? Who was I kidding? Of course I would. I highlighted the address in the hyperlink, a long bizarre domain name that didn't make any sense and some mile-long subdirectory. Suspicious by anyone's standards, but at that moment I didn't care if it blew up the computer. First, I got up to make sure my dad was still asleep, then I opened up a private browser window and pasted it in. The browser worked for a minute, but then returned with the message, domain doesn't appear to exist. My heart sunk. I repasted the link again, but got the same message. Damn it! Trixie must have messed it up when she sent it to me. I brought up the window with her mail, was ready to reply to her message when I clicked the actual link she had sent me. A new browser window popped up, but instead of the not found message, it appeared to be connecting. I waited. To my surprise, a site began to load, a plain black background. When the page was fully rendered, it was hardly passable for a website. Just a plain black screen and a search box. That was all. Whatever this site was, it looked nothing like a flashy cam site. No ads, no sign up button, no donate button. Nothing at all that suggested paying. That was comforting in a way, a little discomforting in another. In my experience, nothing online was there to just be helpful. If this was some kind of chat site, you'd at least expect an advertisement or two. Without any way to take your money, you have to wonder what else this place is trying to take from you. Where to start? I typed Trixie's name into the search box and hit enter. The site worked for a minute, then came up with the message, User Trixie628 is online, and a small window opened up. I saw our names in the window. Kevin, Trixie628. Kevin? Did I even type my name anywhere? Had to be something in that link she sent me. Some kind of token, maybe? But I barely had time to consider it before the message came through. Hi, Kevin. I'm so glad you came. Hi, Trixie. Thanks for inviting me. I've never heard of this place before. My connection isn't too good. It's the only site I can really chat on. Where are you from? I asked. You said you're in Orange Oaks, right? I'm from Summit, not far. Yes, Orange Oaks. Your connection is bad over there? That surprised me. Summit was a nice area. Not the type of place you'd imagine having crappy internet access. Yeah, it's slow where I am. I read that you like gaming. Me too. Which games? The conversation was smooth and easy. No long pauses between replies. I told her my hope for the future. To become a video game tester for one of my favorite game developers. Not at all the big, lucrative game plan most girls want to hear from a prospective companion, but she thought it was cool. And before I knew it, it was past two in the morning. It turned out Trixie and I had a lot in common. She was an outcast in school, same as me. A bit of a weirdo, maybe, but a weirdo gamer girl was exactly what I needed. It was still early to tell, but it seemed like we were hitting it off. It's getting pretty late, she wrote. It is. Can we talk again tomorrow? Sure. How's it like 9 o'clock your time? My time, I wrote. Aren't you in Summit? JK, she said. LOL. Anyway, how about like 10? My dad's kind of a jerk about stuff like this. He's usually passed out by 10, though. That sucks, she wrote. 10 is cool, though. Cool. I'll be on at 10. 
Good night. I'm glad we met. Me too, I wrote. Good night. I checked the clock. It was 2.30 a.m. I desperately had to get to bed or I'd be passing out in class tomorrow. But I wasn't tired at all. I was so excited. I didn't think I'd ever fall asleep. All that waiting. All that hoping that eventually, if I just kept trying, I'd eventually meet someone. Was it possible we were meant to meet like this? I erased my browser history and got in bed by 3 o'clock. Eventually, I did manage to fall asleep, and for once, my dreams were happy ones. And when the alarm went off a couple hours later, I woke up like I had slept a full night. Even the bullies at school couldn't ruin my mood today. Had I fallen in love? It was a crazy idea, I know. I'd only just met her. Not even met her, really. I didn't even know what her voice sounded like. But something had happened, something different. I might be naive at times, and I guess I was a little desperate, but I couldn't downplay this, not even to myself. I couldn't help but be excited, and I didn't want to help it. After all the waiting, after all the nothing, I deserved it. School felt like a snake pit to me. It always had, and it still did, even now in my last year. I barely knew what the place looked like, always with my face pointed at the floor. All around me, people talking to each other like they belong there. Normal people, I guess, but still. There was always something weird to me about that. I'd always wondered what things would be like if I showed up today for the first time. I had had 18 years in Orange Oaks to establish myself as an outcast, but if I started fresh one day, just showed up and tried to fit in, would I be able to fake it? Would Callahan and his cronies still torture me in gym class? Would the groups of girls still snicker behind their locker doors when I shuffled past? A snake pit. A snake pit I had no choice but to hazard nearly every day of my life. I was in the locker room getting changed into my t-shirt and shorts. I'd been focusing on Trixie all day, and I was trying not to let gym class spoil my unusually good mood. Still, I could sense the malevolent forces behind me. Ignore them, I told myself. They don't matter. Good things are happening. A shoe hit the back of my head, leaving my ears ringing. Oh, excuse me, buddy. Shoe got away from me. Could you toss me that? Good things are happening, I repeated to myself. There was nothing in this school, nothing in this dimension that could touch me. Not now, because by ten tonight... I'd be in my own dimension, talking to Trixie. I picked up the shoe and turned around to face Callahan and his followers. But before I could toss it back, the next shoe hit me in the face. By 9 o'clock that night, I was playing Oblivion, but I couldn't focus on what I was doing. I was worried my dad wouldn't pass out on time for me to log in. But when he tapped me on the shoulder and I saw the glazed over look in his eyes, I knew he was close to going to bed. Kevin, he said, I know I don't talk to you a whole lot these days, and I'm sorry about that. Just going through a bit of a rough patch, you know? Hey, what happened to your eye? Nothing. Slipped. How's school been? All right. Grades good? Yeah, I said. That much was true. The only thing perfect about me was my grades. Not that I cared much. It was all just effortless. He sighed, pulled a chair from the table, and sat down heavily. I realize I haven't been a whole lot of help lately, Kevin, and again, I'm sorry, but let me just tell you this. Remember this, and everything will end up okay. All right, Kevin? All right, Dad. What is it? Just keep your eye on the prize, Kev. I know things are uneventful right now, but you'll get into college will get you into a good field where you can find a good job. I don't want to go to college, Dad. We've been through this. You're smart. You'll make good money. Everything will be different. Everything will be better. You just got to set yourself up. Set yourself up for success. You understand, buddy? Oh, I understood. We had had this same conversation a million times since Mom left. I wasn't about to argue with him especially in his condition, 
it would only get him aggravated and keep him awake longer. But how was I supposed to take him seriously? A guy who wanted for me everything I hated. To live a conventional, successful life. To wear a suit and tie to work every day and pick up my dry cleaning on the way home. And look where all that had gotten him. I understand, Dad. He cleared his throat and patted me on the shoulder. Good, I think that about does it for me. I'll see you tomorrow, all right, buddy? All right, good night, Dad. Good night, buddy. Dad shuffled off to the bedroom, as always, trying to walk as soberly as possible and failing miserably. There was nothing sober about him, not in mind or body. I knew he wanted the best for me, but the fact was he had never known what was best for himself. If it were up to him, I wouldn't do a thing but work until I graduated college. Maybe it seemed like a good idea on paper, but people aren't made of paper. I was a living, breathing person. I was suffering in school. I was starving in this little apartment, and chatting with Trixie the night before had only kindled my appetite. I wasn't going to college. All I wanted was to find someone else like me. My heart wasn't made of paper, and the heart wants what it wants. Maybe Dad's did too, but his heart wasn't anything like mine. I waited patiently for Dad to start sawing wood in the other room. It didn't take long. I had to reload the dating site to get that weird link again, but I had lost all interest in the site itself and closed it as soon as the chat site started loading. I was a little early, but was ecstatic to see Trixie was already logged on. She had been waiting for me. Hi, Kevin. Hey, Trixie. I thought my dad would never get to bed. LOL. Did you get any sleep last night? A little. How about you? There was a little pause, then eventually she replied. Not really. I'm pretty tired. Tired of everything. I told her I'd be sure not to keep her up all night again, and she agreed. There was always tomorrow, after all. Why rush things? We chatted casually for a little while, but as the night went on and the moon shone brighter in the window, our conversation took on a kind of gravity. I had stayed away from asking Trixie about her home life. It seemed better to let those things come out on their own. I got the idea she wanted to discuss some of those things, but maybe she wasn't ready. I just want to get out of here, she wrote. Go somewhere else. Somewhere nice. It hurt me in a way that she was saying those things. Wasn't it perfect, after all, that we had met this way, only a couple of towns apart? What if we were soulmates? How could she already be thinking about leaving? Well, don't leave just yet. We haven't even met. I'm just dreaming, she wrote. I'm looking forward to meeting you. When do you think we can? I asked. Soon. As soon as possible. Really? I'm totally cool with that. I mean... When can we meet? Neither one of us had a car. I'd have to get a ride somehow. I wondered what I would wear. All my clothes were garbage. My skin was a mess too. I wondered if I started tonight how many acne treatments it would take to get cleared up in time. It took longer than usual for her to reply, but when she did, it was a longer than usual message. I really want to meet you, Kevin. I really like you. I hope that's not too forward of me to say but I feel like I can be totally honest with you. I've never felt that way about anyone before. The message made my stomach feel funny. It wasn't too forward at all. I felt the same way she did. She could tell me anything. I really like you too, I wrote. We should meet as soon as possible. Wherever you want, I'll get there, even if it kills me. Another pause. Finally, she wrote, I have to tell you something, Kevin and I'm worried that when I tell you, you'll change your mind. I promise that if you do, I won't blame you. I just really hope you don't. I'm scared, Kevin, because I've never felt so connected to anyone before. And after I tell you what I need to tell you, you may never want to talk to me again. Impossible. The possibilities ran through my mind. Was she crippled? Missing a leg? Deaf? Blind? But I wasn't a superficial person. No matter what I thought of, the answer was still yes. I most definitely wanted to meet her. Don't worry, I wrote. I feel the same way you do, Trixie. You can tell me anything. A longer pause this time. 
Finally, the reply came. I don't want to scare you off, Kevin. I'm not in Summit anymore. I'm in another place now. It's a different place, and in order for us to meet, you have to come to this place too. Well, where is it? I wrote. I'm sure I can get there somehow. This was the longest pause, but my eyes didn't leave the screen while I waited. I died in Summit, Kevin. Now I'm somewhere else, and in order for you to meet me, you have to be dead too. I could barely keep my eyes open at school the next day. Besides a couple of the bullies, though, no one really noticed. That was the story of my life, really. Most of the time, I felt like the invisible boy. In my favorite RPG video games, you always had a number of skill points you could distribute to choose your character's best attributes. Strength, charisma, dexterity, endurance, etc., etc. I always put a lot of skill points into charisma. It helped you interact with other characters to affect better outcomes. In real life, it seemed like my charisma was permanently stuck on zero. No one noticed me, and when they did, it was never a positive response. The bullies only stopped teasing me when they got bored of it. Even my teachers couldn't help but yawn when I asked them questions. If I had any high attribute at all, it was the ability to slip through life without being noticed. Stealth, but not the roguish stealth you use to your advantage in video games, my stealth was dullness. And because of that, I'd only been noticed by one girl over my entire high school career, a supposedly dead girl from Summit. It was also because of that I was able to sneak out of gym class without being caught. I was also able to sneak into the library to do some research in the newspaper database. It wasn't long before I found what I was looking for. At the sight of the name in print, my stomach nodded. Trixie Williams, 18 of Summit, was discovered dead on Sunday morning by her parents, Sue and Andrew Williams. Trixie suffered from depression, her parents explained to police, although she had showed no sign of suicidal thoughts or behavior prior to the incident. She actually seemed really happy the past few days, Andrew explained. It was the last thing we expected. Trixie was a talented artist and hoped to work in video game design. She enjoyed painting, playing the guitar, and playing video games. Services will be held at Summit Memorial Home this Friday, February 26. The date of the paper was 2017, three years ago. Trixie still claimed to be 18 years old. I just sat there for a while, staring at the article and trying to process the information. This had to be some kind of prank, some sadistic weirdo trying to get me to kill myself. But why would anyone want to do that? To create a profile? To stay up until 2 in the morning trying to convince the most inconsequential human alive to commit suicide? It didn't make any sense. I checked to make sure no one was around and opened up a new window to sign on to the dating site. I accessed my messages and hit the link. The browser worked for a while, then returned the familiar message, the domain doesn't appear to exist. I tried again, but got the same result. I put the domain in the search engine and scrolled through pages and pages of supposed matches, but not one pertinent result showed up. The link only worked on my home computer, almost like the site was intended just for me. Some kind of dark web thing? But no, you needed a special browser for that. Internet Explorer didn't make the grade. It was more than that. It was surreal. That was a word for it. Surreal. I checked my watch. 20 minutes until I needed to be at my next class. There was a feeling in my stomach like I was starting to get sick. Was this Trixie thing some kind of sadistic prank using unheard of technology, or was it real? There were only two possibilities, I decided. It was fake, or it was surreal. And if it was surreal, and if it was surreal, did that disqualify it from being real? Trixie Williams, 18 of Summit. The girl was real. At least she was in 2017. My feelings were real. If she wasn't real, then why couldn't I let her go? Like winning the lottery and giving all the money away. Giving up these feelings would leave me in a worse place than I was before. I couldn't, I knew. I wouldn't. It was all I had right now. The heart wants what it wants.
I was playing video games at home, always keeping an eye on the clock. 9 p.m. Every 20 minutes or so, my dad would come out of the bedroom and shuffle into the kitchen. He'd take the bottle off the top of the refrigerator and fill his glass, open the freezer and drop in a couple of ice cubes. Then he'd retreat to the bedroom and disappear for a while. Sometimes he'd hit me with some fatherly platitude on the way out like, You do your homework, buddy? And I'd tell him, Yes, Dad. And he'd nod, and that would be that. But tonight he paused by his door and walked back to the living room. I could sense him standing behind me. Got some news for you, buddy, he said. I paused the game and turned to face him. Look, I know you've got your own ideas about things, but I want you to know I only want the best for you. You know that, don't you, buddy? What is it, Dad? Look, I went ahead and applied you to Georgetown University, just like your old dad. And you know what? You got accepted. The smile he put on was like a car salesman trying to unload a junk car. He knew just what I thought of that, and the idea that he thought he could sell it with a smile made me that much more angry. We've been through this, Dad. I'm not like you. I'm not going to college. That's ridiculous, buddy. You're smart enough to know that. I'm smart enough to know I don't want to do things your way. I'll be just fine. I'll figure something out. It's been figured out, Kevin. There's a way to do things. There's a recipe for success, and it's been figured out for a long time. You go to a good college, you get a good degree, and then you're successful. And that's what I want for you. You want me to be successful? Like you, Dad? The implication was obvious, and I could tell that it stung him. Listen to me. I'm not going to try and tell you I did everything right in my life. No one does, okay? But a lot of stuff I got right, and I need you to get those things right too. Look at yourself. Look at where those right things got you. You think I want to be anything like that? You think I want to be anything like you? You are a lot like me, Kevin. You've got the smarts. You've got what it takes. But here's some news for you if you don't know it. You need money to live a good life, and you're not going to make that kind of money playing video games and sitting around not having a plan. Maybe I've got a plan, Dad, and maybe that plan doesn't include fucking college. You're going. I'm not going, and I'm sure as hell not going to go where you went. What the hell do you care anyway? Is it that important that I end up like you did to marry some psychopath who fucks up my life and leaves? I want you to have choices, not to make all the choices I made, but to have those choices. He shook his head like he was hoping to fit his thoughts together. Let me level with you, Kevin. You're not going to build a life by chance. You're not going to catch some great stroke of luck. And it hurts me to say it, but you're not going to get by on your looks. You've got brains, Kevin. That's what you've got. And God knows why you don't want to use them, but... I threw my video game controller at the wall. It left a dent in the sheetrock and landed on the floor in pieces. He glared at me, wide-eyed and speechless. Fuck you, Dad. Fuck your college and fuck your success. You're a loser. And maybe I'll be a loser too, but I'll never be a loser like you. My dad couldn't speak. He just stood there smelling like booze and sweat, not knowing what to say. My eyes never left his. Finally, he turned and shuffled back to his bedroom. You're going, he said quietly. If not to Georgetown, then somewhere else. Not here. He went into the bedroom and slammed the door behind him. Then it was quiet. Very quiet. It was still quiet at 9.30 and he hadn't come out for another drink. At 9.45, I put my ear to the bedroom door and heard him snoring. He had made his escape early tonight. I was free. And only then had I settled down enough to think about what he had said. I was going, he had said. Georgetown or somewhere else. Not here. He was going to kick me out. He couldn't force me to go back to school, but he could force me out on my own. So I was going to have to come up with some plan after all. And what would that entail? 
Some shitty retail job with barely enough money to get by? Wasn't that exactly what he hoped for me to avoid? I needed some time. A new set of armor. A better loadout. I wasn't ready yet. Damn it. I sat at the computer and pulled up the weird link, clicked it. Trixie wasn't on yet. No messages in my inbox. Damn, did I need to talk to someone. Every second that went by felt like an hour, and something else occurred to me then. How would I talk to Trixie if Dad kicked me out? This only worked on this computer, only in this apartment. Would I lose her too, along with everything else? Damn! I brought my fist down on the desk, then cursed myself for making noise. It didn't matter, Dad was still snoring. Drugged up prick. He was no different than Callahan and his goons at school, doing his best to make me miserable. I could only imagine what they had in store for me at Georgetown. Four more years of hell, a gilded sheet of paper, a first-class ticket to a life of misery. I could hear it right now. I'm sorry, Mr. Gardner, but don't you think you're a bit overqualified for this position? I mean, a degree in finance from Georgetown University? Why would a guy like you want to settle for four walls and a PlayStation? I clenched my fists but resisted the urge to pound the desk again. It was 9.55. Still no Trixie. I turned my chair to face the wall, still with the empty inbox icon burned onto my retinas. I took a deep breath and considered things. Maybe I was overreacting about college. Maybe this was my chance to do what I'd always fantasized about, to show up somewhere completely different to redistribute my attribute points, to start fresh, like a whole new character. But how long would I be able to pull that off? How long before I became an outcast again? Started walking the halls with my eyes glued to the floor and the girls cackling as I shuffled by. And add to that, no way to chat with Trixie anymore. Not only would we never meet, but we'd be cut off completely. And while I rotted away at college, She'd be rotting away wherever she was. She seemed so lonely. Just as lonely as me. And eventually she'd find someone else. Someone with the determination to actually meet her. And I'd be heading to work in my suit and tie and picking up my dry cleaning on the way home to my empty apartment. And sitting on my computer scrolling through profiles and watching my empty mailbox while no one replied. No one because I missed my shot. I walked away from the slot machine and the next guy pulled the winning lever, because I missed my jackpot and it was the last chance I'd ever get. And I'd... My heart was racing. I turned back to the computer. The light from the screen had taken on a blue glow too bright to look at. I stood up on weak and wobbly legs and slid the chair away. I walked down the hall to my dad's bedroom and slowly pushed the door open. He was snoring. I walked around the bed and picked up the little orange bottle on the end table and left the room. In the kitchen, I poured out the contents of the bottle and counted the little oblong pills. Twenty-four of them. Harmless, innocuous little things they seemed, but not all at once they weren't. I took Dad's bottle off the top of the refrigerator and unscrewed the cap. I took three or four pills at a time, chased them down with the booze until they were gone. My heart wasn't racing anymore but my arms and legs were still weak and wobbly. It occurred to me that I ought to wipe my history and turn off the computer, but on the heels of that, I knew it didn't really matter. I could feel the alcohol soaking into my bloodstream and brought back a memory from my childhood when I'd snuck a beer from my dad at a barbecue. That warm, relaxed feeling like everything was suddenly right with the world. It felt odd to me back then, but tonight, it was exactly what I needed. And unlike then, this time, I didn't want to go back. And I wouldn't have to. I was going. Not to Georgetown, but not here. I sat where I was for a minute, my flesh oozing between the slats of the wooden kitchen chair. Eventually, I forced myself to my feet and back to the computer. My arm felt weighed down, and the mouse felt glued to the desk. I didn't know if Trixie was still online, but I knew she would get my message. In the text field, I typed, Trixie, I'm coming. Trixie's not here. Then again, neither am I. They carried out my body earlier this morning. 
I was lying prone on the floor next to the computer, still with the strange sight open on the desktop. Even then, I was watching, waiting for Trixie's reply. But the moment my dad thought to look at it, the browser crashed and shut down on its own. It was for my eyes only. I know intuitively that I'm stuck here, the same way I'd be if I'd jumped off a moving train somewhere. Dad's back in bed, performing his famous disappearing act. No pills this time. That's my fault, I guess. Maybe the whole thing is my fault. I wonder if he'll come to join me one day. Maybe the two of us share the same destiny after all. The browser reopens as I stand in front of the computer, the strange address refreshing in the URL field. The site opens and there's the plain black screen and thread of messages. Trixie is typing. I'm sorry, she says. Sorry? For what? What has she got me into? I reach for the keyboard, but my fingers find no purchase. And how is she typing? There has to be some kind of trick to this. It's like a video game when you think about it. Maybe I'm stuck now, but I've got all the time in the world to figure it out. It's a waiting game. A numbers game. As long as I keep playing, I'm still in the game. I'm not going to Georgetown. That much I know. Whether I'm going anywhere else is left to be seen. Things don't always turn out the way you expect them to. My dad could tell you that. But hope persists, even beyond the persistence of the flesh. It's the antidote to the tortured soul. Without torture, I wonder if hope would even exist. Trixie has logged out. She probably knows I can't reply. Not yet. But Trixie and I are the same now. I'll figure this out. There's got to be some bug, some exploit in this game. And who better to find it than me? I'll find it by God. I'll find it. I'll find it. Blight Gardner awoke to an oppressive physical darkness. It embraced him. As the cold shadows flowed around him, he felt himself falling, slowly but surely. He tried to reach out, to flail, and to grasp, but only pain greeted him. Something bit into his wrists like fiery needles. His hands found each other fast, and they clasped together with interlocked fingers. They'd been bound behind his back. When he tried his feet, not only did he find the same intrusion of pain, but there was also a weight there, a tension that dangled below his legs that dragged him along. As were his hands, so had his legs been bound, and something was pulling him deeper, farther into the dark. After a few seconds, a pressure came upon him. He felt it around his eyes and deep in his sinuses. The shadows had become overwhelming and heavy, aggressive. The further along he went, the greater the weight of the blackness. Every time he moved, he heard the darkness move, too. It was a physical presence. He felt himself push through it. It felt familiar, very familiar. He felt something in his mouth, plastic, malleable. He breathed through it, and it stagnant air filled his lungs. When he released it, he felt the air move out the sides of his mouth. It was then he had the sudden, sinking realization. His predicament finally made horrible sense. The air was released from the sides of his mouth, and it formed bubbles that fizzed in the darkness around him. He heard them, and felt them against his face as they floated away. Some of the pressure left his face. The air that escaped paved the way to his terrible understanding. Some of the darkness seeped in through the corners of his mouth. Its salty, gritty texture filled his dried mouth. The taste reaffirmed his worst nightmare. No, he thought. No, 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 no. This cannot be. No. He tried to scream just moments before he reached his silk-covered destination. No one would hear him, for he was alone. Alone, bound, and trapped on the ocean floor. 
The panic that beset him was unlike any he'd ever known before, and again he started fighting his restraints, a useless gesture. He tossed and turned like a fish at the end of a long line. He stood no chance of escaping. The ropes that bound him were far too tight and thick for that. After several minutes, Blake felt a terrible exhaustion set in. The water chilled him. The only warmth came from the failing adrenaline surging within his shivering veins. The salt stung at his chest with needles and pins. A shocking and unwelcome pain. He stared into the dark. He was mortified by the almost perfect darkness before him. In the night, and at his depth, he was positive his visibility was no more than a few inches in front of his face, yet he knew he could see. His eyes, and nose for that matter, were both dry. They were covered. Someone had given him a mask to see through, but why? He could see nothing. Nothing, and beyond that nothing... The shadows swirled thick and devious, concealing everything from the smallest plankton to the largest predator. His breathing accelerated as his mind kindly illuminated the shadows beyond. He saw sharks, hundreds of them circling, their eyes as black as the water, their teeth shining in a bloody white radiance. They all smiled at him. They'd been given such a lovely present. That was what he was, wasn't it? a gift to anything and everything that lurked below. The only thing he was missing was a pretty little bow. And he'd be alive to feel it. Whoever had damned him here made sure of that. What cruel bastard sends a man to the deep while he's asleep? What had happened? His memory was a jigsaw shoved onto the floor, scattered and unorganized. His mind tried to repair it, but the pieces wouldn't fit. In his current state, the reconstruction of said puzzle looked incredibly unlikely. And there was something about a party, a bar. The current ran across the small of his naked back like a giant centipede. Imaginary or not, Blake turned, twisting his bonds, but the image before him remained the same. If anything had been there, he'd never have known. As he rolled to his left and then back to his right, nothing changed. The static image of nothingness held his focus tight like a vice. It continued to do so until he looked up. The appearance of some light, any light at all, should have helped alleviate his fears, but instead it felt as though his heart had shriveled up and died within his chest. The moon watched him from overhead, too far away to offer any help. Its light was dulled and blurred by the surface, a surface which must have sat at least seventy feet away, a swimmable distance, a good distance for any diver who wasn't bound to the bottom of the sea. It could be worse, his mind decided to say. Yet the temptation of the waves above and the soothing light of the moon offered him no hope. They merely mocked him with the release he couldn't have. Before his eyes, the moon was swallowed by the dark. Blake grasped fast for the rope below. Holding it tight, he pulled and thrashed until his back was brought to bear against the hard concrete block that had sunk him. His heart raced, his eyes strained in suffocating black. Something, somewhere above, had just crossed between him and the only light he had left. Something big, and he could not see it. He could only wait for it to take. Seconds passed, earned. Minutes passed, and he was still alive. His grip relaxed. Cautious, he was very cautious. He felt himself rise, held buoyant by the breath in his lungs. In the depths, it wasn't just his eyes that failed him. All his senses had seemingly abandoned him to his fate. His hearing was useless. The ones who had damned him to the deep had placed earplugs in his ears, and though they'd surely saved his eardrums from rupturing under the water, the only sounds that came through them were harsh and static. All the ocean offered him was a droning white noise. 
down there in the deep. The only sense he had unhampered was his touch, but that could only help him so much. He was a prisoner in an unaccessible hell. It took about five minutes, an unspeakable amount of time for Blake, before light would reappear in the waters above. In that time, Blake, fueled by his fear of the suffocating unknown, had been feeling around his restraints, reaffirmed what he already knew. Rope had bound him at the wrists and at the ankles. He followed the line beneath his ankles and felt about the cinder block that had pulled him down. The rope wrapped around it many times. Each strand was as thick as his thumb, and he couldn't find any knot. It was surely on the other side of the block, suffocated in the thick muck below. He couldn't untie it. The idea of his pocket knife came to mind. He should have had it on him. He never went anywhere without it. It was a good, hopeful idea for a few seconds. When he reached upwards for his shorts, he was only met with the touch of his own skin. His chin, as if he could see himself. His chin rubbed against his raw collarbone, and Blake found he was also without a shirt. He was naked, completely exposed and naked. They'd stripped him of not only his freedom and of his understanding, but of his goddamn clothes as well. His knife surely sat comfortably in his clothes, far away from him, above the surface. He cursed in an explosion of air and fury that had taken over from the bone-numbing fear he'd felt moments before. It was a feeling that any man who has had hope torn from his chest so quickly after finding it knows all too well. In the darkness, however, it was a fleeting feeling. The cold that crept along his skin made itself known once more. It begged for Blake's attention. Where was he before? His mind wandered back to the jigsaw puzzle, and had found some of the pieces unturned. A bar. Downtown L.A. That was it. His last memories of freedom. And they were spent in... Just a typical Friday night. Not exactly respectable, but... Not worth his situation, surely. What could he have done to elicit this fate? An alley. He flipped a jigsaw piece in his head. There'd been a woman there. She'd called... Beautiful woman. Blonde. Green eyes. What happened then? Another piece flipped. She wasn't alone, was she? Another piece. She'd offered him a drink earlier. Something was in it. The puzzle turning stopped. For the first time in what felt like a lifetime, something above caught his eye. As if granted by a cruel god, a green light descended from the surface. It caught his eye early, and he followed it as it sunk beside him. It fell gracefully, almost perfectly, through the water. In a slow drop, it settled nicely in the silt below. Blake saw pieces of the sediment rise around the light in a thin cloud as the dim LED glow stick touched the ocean floor. His only cup had landed just beyond his grasp. He tried, of course, but he found the weight that tethered him to the bottom was too great to move. So the light remained nearby, but unusable. He tried to hover close to its glow. It showed him the smooth silt of the bottom for the first time. The vaguest silhouette of it had appeared around his sight. When he looked down, he could see the outline of his chest. More importantly, he could see that in the yard or so between him and the light, he was perfectly alone. He smiled until he realized the light in front of him had somehow increased the eeriness of the wall of black behind him. He could feel it sticking to his skin like a giant spider's web. Its caress was unwelcome. He thrashed around, struggling to pull the block closer to the light, but he accomplished nothing. More motion attracted his gaze from above. There were more glow sticks. Three more descended from the surface. He saw two of them enter the water from above, near where the moon had been. 
They illuminated the faintest shape of the object that sat above his head. A boat. Help? Were the lights there to pave the way for a dive team? The idea was sweet as it rolled in his head, but it seemed so unlikely. The stinging on his chest brought the pessimists. It was his captors above. They were dropping the lights to be cruel. More. As they settled, he noticed that the pattern hadn't been random. The lights all landed around him in a perfectly semicircle formation. He noticed each one had a fishing line wrapped around their middle. They hadn't sunk. They'd been lowered. But why? The prickling feeling on his chest got worse. The light around him had grown helpful. Blake could see himself for the most part in their sickly green glow. It was both reassuring and disheartening to see the seafloor around him. He was thankful to see the silt free of crabs or other aquatic nightmares. The idea of something crawling up the ropes and onto him made him shiver. However, to see that only algae spotted the bottom was crushing. There was nothing. No seashell, no shark tooth, nothing that Blake could have possibly used to cut himself free. His head drooped in frustration. There was something on his chest. No, not on. Something was in his chest, cut into. Someone had cut all over his chest, and the cuts were purposeful in their direction and design. They'd cut shapes, symbols, into his chest. Blake spent his whole life in L.A., a city boy through and through, but he knew a brand when he saw one. He had been branded. To Blake, it felt more than a physical injury. It was a violation upon him, a desecration. His gut churned, and his fingernails bit into the palms of his hands with a furious persistence. Another glow stick fell from the surface. The glow stick, the final light, fell opposite of the semicircular formation behind him. Its light was unguided. As it sank, it whirled at the water's mercy. It fell until it was just above him. It fell until it was almost an arm's reach away from his face. It fell toward his feet. Then, Blake watched as it sank past the ocean floor. It was with horror that Blake followed the light's descent. He merely had to lean forward to watch as the light carved its way farther and farther into darkness. He watched, eyes wide, as the light slipped so far into darkness it had become a memory, faded and dull. As it sank, it had revealed to Blake everything. It had shown him the solid wall of sand and rock it passed as it sunk, the same wall Blake sat atop of. It showed him a depth without end. The light had shown Blake that he was only a mere foot away from the oceanic drop-off. The trench before him was hidden once more in shadow, so perfectly that Blake started to wonder if he'd hallucinated it. His heart knew he hadn't. He'd been dropped, perfectly, at the edge of certain death, and the light was his captors intentionally showing it. From the surface, they played a cruel game with Blake, a tear caught at the bottom of his face mask. He wasn't sure if missing the trench had been a blessing or a curse. If he'd gone over, if it was half as deep as he'd thought, then the pressure would surely kill him. If not, then the sudden descent would have played havoc with his blood. Blake wasn't a seafaring man, but he wasn't a moron. He knew what the pressures of the deep ocean could do, and the creatures that lived down there were far more frightening than any shark. The thought of it, of one of those creatures rising, made him recoil further. His back came to rest against the slime of the ocean floor. He lay in the comfortable circle of light. Up here, at the edge of oblivion, he was condemned to wait. Death could come at any time, Blake was sure of that. That was the worst of it, the waiting. Blake considered, if only for a moment, pushing himself over the edge. He would die, painfully, 
but it would be faster. It would also be on his own terms. The idea of control gave him some satisfaction, but how would he move the weight? Last he tried, it had been impossible, and who was to say the depth was far enough to kill him? What if he landed at the perfect place between agony and death? It was too risky. He could have chosen to stop breathing. No, he could have made it even easier than that. He could have just spit out his regulator. <laughs> that would have been more peaceful, less painful. Either way, Blake decided it was far preferable to die as he wanted than to die as the bastards above wanted him to. He just needed to gather the courage. Courage ran in short supply as the lost light began to emerge from the dark. Blake had risen to a floating position again when, in his peripherals, he saw the faint glimmer beyond the edge of the trench. He avoided it. Surely it wasn't real. It was his mind, his panic. If he ignored it, he'd suffer no consequence. Yet the light persisted, and soon the glow became unmistakable. The shimmer called to Blake from just past the edge, in the deep. Blake looked. The light was rising. Against all logic and sanity, the last light had begun to ascend in the frigid waters. It showed Blake something awful. Below its light, the shadowed waters seemed to breathe and stir. In the periphery of the rising green light, Shades changed as something rose from the depths. It was a sickening realization that came when he saw the shadows had wrapped themselves around the middle of the glow stick. The light was rising because something was carrying it. Blake's view was again obscured by bubbles and darkness as he retreated from the abysmal edge. In quick, pathetic motions, he tried to pull himself away from the rising terror felt the prickly sand press up against his back as he wrestled futilely with his restraints. Unfortunately, he had neither the strength nor the energy to break the vacuous hold the sediment had upon the block. He could do little more than yell through his regulator as the light peaked. Blake could see it now. As the light stopped its vertical ascent, a disturbing scene greeted him. He would have given anything to return to the darkness as a figure clambered up and over the ledge. It stood directly before him on two naked legs. Their eyes met. The sight before him was unimaginable. The light had been carried up by a man. No, not a man. A corpse. The light showed enough to confirm that. The man's bare skin had grown ragged and gray, waterlogged by untold months beneath the waves. Some sections of flesh had long since given away, surrendered to the sea, revealing the fetid muscles beneath. Blake gagged when he noticed the tiny tendrils of tattered skin dangled off into the distance, sights upon the man's body where the denizens of the ocean had begun to pick him apart and eat piece by piece. Rigor mortis had a tight grip upon the man's pain-tortured face. His eyes were as wide like his mouth, frozen in an eternal, silent scream. He'd been dead for a long time, yet his eyes still moved. They fixed themselves upon Blake. The monstrous vision held the light close to its face, and Blake couldn't help himself. He stared deeply into those clouded, grayed eyes. Blake could see, though, behind its gaze. The soul sat within it. The corpse leaned closer, brought by an unseen current, perhaps, towards Blake. Extending its free arm in a rigid, almost robotic fashion, it began to examine him. It seemed inquisitive, like a man examining vegetables at a supermarket. It was morbid in the way it moved. When in motion, the limbs and muscles of the figure seemed healthy, alive. Yet every time the motion stopped, the body resumed a state of incredible rigidity, caught in a constant state of flux. 
the man who appeared both living and dead. Blake, petrified before this horror, saw as the corpse's eyes left his and fell upon his chest. Lowering its light, its other hand came forward, and its waterlogged finger began to trace the patterns carved into Blake's chest as if it were following the streets on a map. Revolted at the creature's touch, Blake squirmed and twitched, but the corpse held no contempt. It followed his every motion with intense precision. Seemingly satisfied, it lifted itself back. No, it was pulled back. There was something behind the corpse. Like a pillar in the light, a shape had taken form behind the moving carcass. It rose out of sight, above and below, with every swaying motion. Corpse made in the water, the pillar followed like an enormous shadow. The corpse danced at the pillar's will, a puppet for the puppeteer. Before he could grant it any further thought, attention was called back to the corpse, as it had brought the glow stick toward its own chest. It became deadly still in the water. It was waiting for Blake to see. It had to show it. The corpse showed Blake his chest and the familiar brand upon it. Blake was staring at the very same symbols that had been cut into his own chest. It wasn't an execution or some random, cruel murder. He hadn't pissed off the wrong man. No, it was far worse and far more primal than that. It was a sacrifice, and Blake was the lamb. As Blake's eyes stretched wide, the corpse dropped the glow stick and it rose toward the surface. The pillar carried the figure into the shadows above. At that moment, Blake made the decision that whatever was to happen next was the worst-case scenario. Everything else was preferable. He wouldn't be the lamb. He tried to spit out his regulator. Disgusting salty water managed to creep into his mouth as he struggled, but even though his teeth and lips had parted from it, the regulator wouldn't fall from his mouth. Using his tongue, he tried to push it out, but it held fast to his face. He felt the pull of the regulator around his lips and on the back of his head. The bastards hadn't given him a choice. They taped the regulator to his face. He had to be alive for what came next. Through the murk, another corpse appeared. The pillar had brought up another degraded carcass from fathoms below. Blake foundered against the seafloor as the woman inched closer. She was younger than the man who had come before, and her body showed fewer signs of decay. Behind her eyes, however, sat the same cold intelligence. That sentience watched him as she rose away into the dark. Her visage fleeting, Blake saw that across her bare chest was etched the same symbols. Symbols of the damned. Another corpse came. This one was horribly disfigured and mangled. There was more rot than man left on his bones, yet the eyes remained lively. His jaw dangled by only strands of sinew, and his right arm had long since been torn asunder at the elbow. The white of the bone seemed to glimmer in the dull light. Despite the rot, the edges of the symbols were still visible on his white chest, and his left hand managed to hold on threateningly, to an old, rusted dagger. Like the others, the rotted man faded into the above. More bodies appeared as the endless pillar rose. They came one after another. Each one bore a look of indescribable anguish and pain on their face, a look that they forever carried, enslaved by the alien pillar behind them. Around Blake, a storm of currents had begun to churn the sediment into a frenzy. What little light he had soon started to dirty, as a swirling cloud threatened to drown it all out. The currents came from beyond the light. Things moved unseen out there in the dark. They started to touch him. Like light, arms and hands long gone cold reached for him. Whenever his back was turned, they'd project themselves from the darkness like a sunken jack-in-a-box. He'd feel their slime-covered fingers caress him, 
Their nails would jab and scratch him, and each and every time Blake turned around he would see just enough. An arm sucked back into the void, beyond his gaze, the cat toying with the mouse. A mouse with its back crushed in a trap. That was when she entered into the light. A horrid witch of a woman. Her skin had withered, and she seemed more bone now than flesh. The symbol on her chest had fallen away, and only the scars on her ribcage remained. Her sunken eyes glared harshly as she reached for his face. Blake screamed for help that would never come, as the woman ensnared him in her decomposing fingers. She brought him in close, hugging him tightly, as if they'd been friends, with muscles Blake didn't even think she'd had. He could feel a touch on his neck as she exhaled water from her lungs. Up close, Blake saw every horrible detail. The pillar was clear now, and it was obvious that it was alive. It was the dull, rotted color of the corpses, and it had the obvious texture of meat. From the woman flowed the strings of the puppeteer, veins and tentacles that long ago forcibly invaded her body, fed directly into the enormous mass behind her. In the dimming light, Blake swore he saw them pulsate. They were pumping like the veins beneath his skin. He felt another liquid breath on his neck. Craning around, he saw what he'd believed to be a pillar wrapped around behind him. The first man he'd seen had emerged, and the pillar carried him away. The mass of flesh that had fused to his back lifted his body upward toward the surface. His eyes never left Blake. In the shadows, the pillar seemed to squirm and twist as it snaked its way up, thickening the further it went. As it positioned itself, Blake understood what it was that had risen from the trench. The pillar was actually an enormous tentacle, like the suckers of an octopus. The tentacle had used the woman's arms to hold Blake tight. Behind him, the tentacle had brought into position the ghastly, one-armed man Blake had seen earlier. The woman tightened her grip as she presented Blake to the one-armed man. Craning his neck, Blake saw the man fumble with the rusted dagger. He brought it sharply toward the bonds that held Blake's ankles so tight, and he began to cut. It was reckless and precise as he sawed through the ropes. As the binds came loose, Blake grimaced as the knife continued to saw. The man had accidentally severed a slice of skin from the side of Blake's ankle. Blake felt his legs come apart from each other, and he let them spread into the water. He was free from the bottom. Free. In that instant, the fight started. He let loose with the fury and panic that the entire ordeal had granted him, but the corpse held tight. In fact, the more he struggled, the tighter her grasp got. The strength was far too great to resist, and soon Blake started to feel his ribs bend and strain. He couldn't breathe, but he kept fighting. The whole time Blake fought, he saw her horrid gaze, unblinking, unfeeling, unyielding. Despite the thrashing, the puppet corpse behind him decided to proceed with the cutting. This time it took aim at the bonds between Blake's wrists. As he did so, Blake had an idea, a risky, terrible idea. In acceptance of the fact, his legs stopped kicking. The woman released her grip just a knife in kind, and Blake sucked in a huge breath of air. His eyes glared defiantly at the specter. He kept breathing, waiting. He had nothing to lose as he made his move. As soon as the dead man had finished cutting his binds, and at the precise moment the final strand had parted, Blake's palms closed around the rusted blade. If they didn't let go. He wanted to scream as the blade dug into his palm, but he was beyond that now. His veins burned with pure determination. The one-armed man seemed not to possess the same strength as the woman had, for his grip on the knife was weak and feeble. No matter how hard the man pulled behind him, Blake would not release the blade. The woman's face never changed, but Blake saw a hatred grow in her eyes. With a terrible yank that nearly ripped the meat from his palm and bloodied the water all around him, Blake pulled the knife 
and the rest of the man's fingers free. Behind him, the top of the tentacle ran into the dark, carrying corpses along like a morbid roller coaster. But in front of him, the woman didn't retreat. She tightened her vice-like grip. Unfortunately for her, the grip was too high, and she'd found the tank on his back. This provided Blake with ample room to bring his right hand forward and to plunge the blade deep into the woman's stomach. It scraped through her spine, her grip failed just long enough, and Blake pushed himself free. Blake decided he wasn't going to die. The woman tried to recapture Blake, but with a strength he shouldn't have had, Blake brought the blade through the water and into the left eye of the old woman. She didn't scream, but she clenched both eyes tight in pain. A thick black goo seeped from the wound and stuck to Blake's hand like ink. Her arms flailed about, so Blake ripped the knife from her face and he jammed it into the other eye. With that, she recoiled. Her hands came to her face to cover her wounds, and the tentacle fell completely away beyond the light. He was free. He knew his time was short. With his sliced right hand, Blake managed to find the glow stick the beast had dropped by his legs. He brought it to his face just in time to see the tentacle had not left him yet. Another body, a large, overweight man, was soon upon him. His arms reached forth. Their target was Blake's throat. Blake jabbed at the body with the rusted blade, and it retreated fast. Blake enjoyed that. The threat of pain, injury, didn't sit well with the monster. That gave Blake a much-needed edge. Blake knew he couldn't hesitate any further. With a great kick against the block that had imprisoned him, he propelled himself toward the surface, to freedom, to air. He knew at that moment he would surface, even as the nitrogen started to boil in his blood, and as the salt seeped into his fresh wounds, Blake could only think of one thing, the surface breaking around his head, the chilly night sky biting into his scalp, the calming sight of the night sky. The watchful stars would be there, and they would see his final triumph. It would be beautiful. As his body began to betray him, he forced himself through. He knew the tentacle pursued from below. He could feel it, a presence in the water all around him. Hungry, ravenous eyes followed him from below. But he didn't care. He couldn't afford to. His hand was cramping. He found his grip morphing around the light and the knife. He could only hold on to one, so he made a choice. As the knife sunk, Blake grabbed onto the glow stick with both hands. They clung to it like it was a lifeline. The surface was coming. Oh, how close it should have been. Surely only thirty feet. Twenty. Ten. The stars. He should have seen the stars. Instead, only a pained, angry face met his gaze. Blake nearly collided with the corpse that had ambushed him out of the dark. He brought his feet to the corpse's chest and kicked hard against it. He felt the thing's ribs collapse beneath his feet. He circled to his right and tried to rise again. He would make it. He knew he could do it. He found another one. The woman was missing half of her face, but she reached for him regardless. He dove down as she grasped for his legs. He just barely slipped by. Out of nowhere, a hand reached for his face. His momentum carried him past the man and too close to the tentacle. He flipped around and shot far away. A small amount of water invaded his goggles, and the bends began to stab at his muscles. He could do it. Again, he was ambushed. It shouldn't have been possible. The tentacle was everywhere. It was fast. How is it so fast? Then the light showed him the truth. He retreated into the light's periphery, for in its center a body was reaching for him, a devious smile on its face. To his right, the light revealed another one with twisted fingers and an exposed jaw-like ribcage. The bodies floated side by side in the water, their arms extended at length. Blake had no choice. He rose, and yet even there more bodies sat waiting in ambush. The same happened as he swam backwards, too. The bodies all formed a thick wall of nightmares around him. They were too close. 
One of the bodies struck Blake hard in the ribs in passing, and in pain that was finally too overwhelming, he dropped the light. Greedy arms took their chance and assaulted him as the light fell. As it sank, it illuminated the inside of what had become a solid wall of flesh. A swirling maelstrom decorated with death had completely surrounded him. There wasn't just one tentacle. There were dozens, and they had contained him inside a giant sphere. His arms and legs were free, but Blake had never felt more trapped. The tentacles swirled. They kept him from the stars. Through his earplugs, he heard a chorus of screams grow from nothing to overtake the white noise. They came from all around him, escaping out of the throats of the long since deceased. Their faces contorted as the ghoulish melody echoed through the waves. It was a tune of pure mockery and triumph, the song of Blake's defeat. He couldn't do it. He never could have. Blake began to sink. His muscles had stopped working. The pain of the bends was too great for his brain to ignore. He burned inside as the tentacles began to constrict their net. He was only vaguely aware as many more pairs of arms began to claw at him and hold him tightly in submission. The corpses never blinked. Behind his eyes, Blake was screaming. Not from the pain, he screamed in defiance. He screamed against the cruel irony that had perverted his escape. He saw the light at the bottom of the writhing mass of tentacles. Blake watched as the tentacles parted, allowing the light to fall beyond his reach, beyond his sight. The tentacles closed again, and the light died. Blake was in the pitch black, alone with the dead. He couldn't see it, but they started to smile. He felt it when the arms tore the goggles from his face, not that they mattered anymore. The darkness persisted. Only the pain was new. The water assaulted his eyes and forced its way up his nose. The salt burned everything that it touched. He only managed to suck in half a breath as they removed the regulator from his face. The breath was spoiled as water was quick to invade his lungs. Blake sputtered and spat, but all that did was expel the last bit of air from his lungs. As they tore the tank from his back, Blake was drowning. He wouldn't drown fast enough. Though he couldn't see it, the tentacles positioned him strategically. They moved him up against a large, slimy section of barren flesh. Blake's head felt as though it would explode, and that was before the spines entered his body. Once inside, numerous barbed tentacles searched and dug their way into his veins. He felt a warm burning as an alien substance seeped into his veins. Eventually, all of his blood would be lost to the sea, and only the thick blood of the monster would remain. As his head grew dizzy, tiny tendrils dug their way into his spine. The pain was sharp, unbearable as they coiled about his central nervous system, like hungry pythons. Blake tried to scream, but there was no air left to give. No sound escaped his curled lips. He'd hoped for comfort in death, but as the nerves of the beast found hold inside him, he found true hell. His mind became one with the others. Left in darkness, death never found Blake. The weight of the water filled his chest, and the sounds of the dam filled his ears. He heard their screams, hundreds of screams. He felt their pain. Hundreds of lost souls sacrificed. They were all connected. He heard their pleas. Help me, anyone, please. I'm drowning, I'm drowning. Why am I underwater? Who's there? Is anyone? I want my mom. He felt his body move, but nodded his command. He felt his eyes open, but he saw nothing. He felt his lips forced into a smile, but he was anything but happy. He was left with one choice, the last option he could physically achieve. He called for help. No one would answer him, of course, for his pain was their pain. His fate was theirs. As they sunk into the abyss, one alien voice was forced into his mind. All is one here in the colony. 
From their position near the seafloor, beyond the ring of light, the two divers had watched as Blake made for the surface. They knew both better than to interfere, so they had waited patiently. There was no reason to chase after him. The colony had never allowed anyone to escape before. The situation, unseen above, was surely well in hand. The blonde-haired diver watched as the last light sank in front of her. She smiled as it settled. It was done. Moments after, a tentacle had crept into their circle. The blonde-haired woman watched as an elderly man was brought forth. Carried between his arms was an old wooden chest. The other diver took the chest gently and allowed it to sink to the ocean floor. With his partner's help, they opened the chest. The contents were much to their liking. They closed the chest and prepared to make their ascent. However, before they went, the tentacles surrounded them in a similar fashion to how they had surrounded Blake. The divers held themselves unnaturally calm as the dead surrounded them, including the recently deceased Blake Gardner. The tentacles seemed to bring him to showcase at the front of the circle. Using his muscles, they forced Blake's right hand outwards and they extended his fingers up. They made his body wave goodbye before they pulled him into the unknown. This didn't affect the divers at all. Two more bodies were brought to display. They noted the one-armed man who'd lost all but one of his fingers and the blinded woman. In a sickening motion, the one-armed man's body peeled away from the tentacles. The tendrils retracted from his corpse and the flesh peeled around from his back. His body was dropped to the floor below, discarded. The man squirmed but for a moment. They always did that. The woman had often been told it was just a reflex, like a decapitated chicken when it runs. She had other theories, though. She wondered if, for just a moment, the poor souls got control of their bodies back before they became forever still. She honestly didn't care either way. The woman was next. She was useless to the tentacles if she could not see, so she too was abandoned. She settled rather calmly into her sandy grave. As the tentacles left, one final body was brought to the light. On it, a young woman, no older than twenty, presented his right hand clenched into a fist. On it, he raised two fingers toward the divers. The senior diver nodded and held up two of his own in an acknowledgment. With that, the young man smiled, and the creature disappeared into the trench. The two divers packed up. Two more bodies. They had work to do. Tannehill! Get your ass out of that bed before you start sprouting roots! Skeeter yelled. He stood on Yancey's front porch and leaning through the bedroom window, backlit by the sun's first rays. God damn it, sleeping beauty! Nobody around here gonna give you a kiss! After a minute, Yancey stirred. Hallelujah! Skeeter hollered. It's alive! Sleeping beauty ripped a lingering fart that damn near blew the covers off the bed. <laughs> Hey, somebody got on the pork rinds last night, Skeeter said, waving a hand in front of his face. Onion rings from the <clears throat> burger pit, actually, Yancey said, releasing another gas grenade. <laughs> Skeeter sniffed the air. <laughs> With honey mustard dipping sauce? Yep. I think rigor mortis is about to set in. Get your ass up. When Yancey finally rolled his happy ass out the front door, Skeeter was already sitting on the rocking chair on the porch, shelling peanuts and feeding them to the old Appaloosa mare that was snubbed to the handrail with a length of baling wire. Skeeter almost never saddled or even bridled Lucy Bell unless they were going to town. You see, Skeeter had taught Lucy, among other things, to lead by pressing the knee into one side or the other, and that's where she went. 
Besides, they'd taken the shortcut from his place to Yancey's more times than the county commissioner had taken donations under the table. But that's a story for another time. There were two dusty freight liners parked in the big open driveway. Each had Motel 6 sleepers and were pulling aluminum box trailers that had been specifically built for shearing sheep. You see, Yancey was a sheep rancher, just like his father and grandfather. And as far as a family business went, he could have done a lot worse. What time did these yahoos roll in? Skeeter asked. Uh, around midnight. Skeeter checked his watch. Almost six. They should have had time to snort their breakfast by now, he said, making no effort to be funny. The fact is, when it's sheep shearing season, sleep equals lost profit. Yancey walked across the driveway to the bunkhouse to rouse the ranch hands, while Skeeter sauntered over to the semis. John and Willie Cohen climbed down out of the cab of the lead truck and shook hands with Skeeter. The two thin redheads seemed to have aged a good five years since last year's shearing. John, the eldest brother, was rapidly graying, and last year's character lines now resembled the cracks in the parched clay riverbed. Even though Willie was only in his mid-forties, he fared only slightly better than his brother. The freckles that had once evenly covered his features had become visibly darker with blotches of pink. The curse of the redhead, or the result of chain smoking in an enclosed cab. But to each his own, Skeet figured. Good to see you. How have you been? What's new? All of the usual meet and greet BS. Then Yancey walked up and the process started all over again. James and Abe, Yancey's part-time ranch hands, stayed back and waited to join the conversation. And it wasn't long before John asked how they'd been. We're doing good, was Abe's genial answer while James just smiled. Yancey didn't know any other Peruvians, but James and Abe, a.k.a. Javier and Avron Olivas, never seemed to have much to say. But they were two of the hardest-working men he had ever met. They never argued nor even complained and either one of them could snipe a coyote out of a herd of sheep from the next county over, provided the next county was less than 400 yards away, that is. Although they were roughly the same age as the Coens, their raven black hair probably wouldn't yield to a lighter hue or retreat by any measurable amount for many years to come, and the only wrinkles in their otherwise flawless olive complexions were the deep-set unabashed laugh lines. Yancey called them his part-time hands because half the time they were over at Skeet's place helping him run cows, and damned if they weren't just as good with cows as they were with sheep. Between Skeeter, James, and Abe on horseback, Yancey on his side-by-side, -side, and Willie's red heelers, the sheep were pinned up by noon. John and Willie had their trailers backed up to the corrals and the ramp set up. Hot dogs were smoking on the barbecuer, and the cold beer was sitting on ice in the cooler. Everyone gathered around the barbecuer and started serving themselves. Nobody noticed when the bigger of the two healers snuck up behind Skeeter and nipped his leg just above the boot, then retreated to stand beside his owner. Skeeter went over to Abe's horse and took the lariat off his saddle. Walking back, he fed out a medium-sized loop and swung it over his head. He sent the loop out front, then spun it to the left, around behind, to the right, then sent the loop sailing to the end, up around the guilty party's neck. He yanked the loop tight, stepped on the rope, and walked it down till he had the dog's head pinned to the ground. Without protest, Willie stepped back, and Skeeter proceeded putting his boots to ribs. When he was satisfied the dog had learned his lesson, he knelt down and scratched the cur's ear before slipping the rope over its head. The dog licked its lips and with newfound humility backed away. Some lessons are harder to learn than others, but Skeeter was sure this dog would never bite anyone again. While Skeeter had the rope in his hand, he couldn't resist showing off a few gravity-defying tricks that kept the crew entertained and sent the dogs into a frenzy until it was time to get some real work done. Through the years, it had become sort of a tradition that while the sheep were being sheared, Skeeter and Yancey would head off on a hunting trip. They had hunted elk in Colorado, moose in Alaska, turkey in Indiana, and so on. Hell, they had even taken a fishing trip in the high Uintals. This year was no fishing trip, though. 
Yancey had found a website that boasted the hunting trip of a lifetime, and when Skeeter said it looked good to him, Yancey made the reservations. James and Abe would take care of things at Yancey's, and even though Skeet's herd of cows were in a pasture with plenty of feed and a stream full of water, they'd keep an eye on this place too. Talk about a sweet setup. By late afternoon, Yancey had his gear packed away in the idling King Ranch F-250 with custom front and rear bumpers, 8,000 pound winch, 4 inch leveling kit, 40 inch mutters on blackout custom wheels, and one of those air horns that sounded like a train whistle. A pristine coal roller, save for the crumpled tailgate that was the result of backing into a fifth wheel trailer without dropping the tailgate. But it was like Skeeter said, inspecting the aftermath. Now it's a farm truck. Yancey already had a damn farm truck. A few minutes later, the shimmering black behemoth rolled up alongside Skeeter's house, and Yancey shook the windows with the air horn. Skeeter came out of the door carrying two faded green duffel bags, a green camouflage rifle case, and a holstered pistol. Under the weight, his back bowed worse than usual, making it appear he was barreling out his chest. Pinning his elbows back as a means of balancing his misshapen posture gave him the air of a strutting peacock. Skeeter was roughly middle-aged, assuming he would live into his eighties, that is. A few lines were starting to show on his naturally tanned face, and a few rogue strands of gray at his temples, blended into his wavy brown quaff. This rounded out what the casual observer would see if they were looking at something interesting and Skeeter Bowling came up and stood right in front of them. The truth is, that posture that might have struck you as arrogance if you were the judgmental type is actually the result of being born with the dream of being PRCA champion bull rider. And credit where credit is due, by his senior year in high school, he was well on his way to accomplishing his dream. He had the points, the references, and the license fee. All he needed was to turn 18 and fame and fortune would be his for the taking. Then one day, just before graduation, fate stepped in and took a shit right on Skeeter's best laid plans. You see, one warm and sunny Saturday afternoon, Skeeter and a couple of his buddies were bucking out on some practice bulls. Skeet climbed into the chute and eased down onto the back of the bull they called Skedaddle, on account of the fact that after the bull made his fourth right hand circle, he invariably bucked straight ahead for the rest of the ride. Skeeter gave a nod. The gate swung open and as per usual, the massive Brahmin circled out of the chute and turned to the right. After the fourth circle, Skeeter shifted his weight anticipating Skedaddle's signature move. This is the part where fate took a crap. Instead of straightening out, the bull stumbled, then spun to its left in an effort to recover. Skeet's ass slid out and the weight came off his shoulder. He sailed ass over riding helmet and hit the ground unnaturally face down. This wasn't anything he couldn't have walked or at least limped away from, but Skedaddle, normally one of the tamest bulls of the bunch, had one more surprise in store. Before Skeeter caught his first breath, Skedaddle circled around, still bucking high, and planted both back hooves right in the middle of Skeet's back. The other boys ran in and drew the bull away, but the damage was done. The would-be world champion bull rider wouldn't be walking away from this ride. He woke up in a hospital bed feeling like he had been trampled by a bull. Still trying to blink away the cobwebs, he overheard a doctor tell his parents, There's a chance Stephen might not walk again. When he heard his mom began to cry, Skeeter piped up, Hey doc, everyone calls me Skeeter. It came out more like a croak and it immediately set his lungs on fire, but his mom stopped crying, so it was totally worth it. The next morning, the doctor read off the list of Skeeter's injuries. Skeeter heard and felt every word. Three broken vertebrae, four broken ribs, left lung punctured, and a handful of technical BS that Skeeter thought the doctor probably didn't even understand. When he was finished reading the laundry list, Skeeter asked, So, how's the bull doing? Skeeter bet his dad 50 bucks he'd walk out of the hospital in three months, and he bet him another 50 he'd be riding in six months. In the end, it was a draw. True to his word, he walked out of the hospital on his own with two days to spare, but with fused vertebrae, permanent pins, and back brace. 
His bull riding days were a thing of the past. Now ain't you glad you're not the kind of person who judges people too soon? Now let's talk about Yancey. Yancey Tannehill wasn't your run-of-the-mill redneck country boy, even though he did his best to look the part. See, growing up on a sheep ranch outside of Lexington, Kentucky was a pretty simple life. His dad worked hard and taught Yancey to do the same, but as the years passed, the money got tighter and tighter, until eventually his dad had to take a part-time job at Matt's Engine and Transmission just to make ends meet. Yancey had tried to make suggestions to his father about improvements and ways to eke out more profits, but his dad, God bless him, was set in his ways. This is how your granddad did things, he'd say, looking the place over. Now that your mom's gone, well, maybe I'll just sell this old place. Then the pause. Unless I could find someone to take it over. Yancey had a mountain of respect for his father, but he had a stubborn streak of his own. So before taking the reins and with his dad's dubious blessing, he enrolled in a fairly prestigious college on a free ride wrestling scholarship. With unwavering determination, he earned himself a degree in zoology and was working toward a bachelor's degree in genetic studies when he got the word that his dad had passed away. So, ready or not, the wrench was his. He used what he had learned at the brain press to crossbreed his herd to get stronger, healthier sheep with higher birth rates and greater wool yields. He also more than doubled the size of his herd and the usable pasture land. Tana Hill Sheep Ranch wasn't just competitive again, it was the new standard. Since his days at college, Yancey had become hooked on classical literature, and even though he didn't like it, he even tasted quiche. He kept in shape by running and hitting the gym three days a week. Without realizing it, the longer he spent away at school, the less noticeable his Tennessee accent became, to the point where he began to sound more like some southern gentleman. When he came home for his dad's funeral, the first person he went to see was his oldest and closest friend, Skeet. And to Yancey's surprise, the first words out of his mouth were slathered with a draw thicker than mama's mashed potatoes and mutton gravy. To thine own self be true, y'all. After stowing his gear in the back and stashing his pistol under the passenger seat, Skeeter bailed in and hollered, What the fuck are we still doing in Lexington by God, Kentucky? Yancey stomped on the throttle and squealed like a pig in heat. When the RPMs came back down, he eased the transmission into drive, and they rolled at a leisurely speed down the driveway. You ever kiss a hog square on the snout? Skeeter asked, still drunk with excitement. No, but I kissed your sister once, Yancey shot back, then braced for a bitch slap. Skeeter looked at him kind of thoughtful-like then asked, How long did you have to wait in line? Rolling down I-75 with the classic rock crank to an 11, the power stroke chewed up the miles, and dusk turned to nightfall as they crossed the state line. Skeeter woke with a jolt as his head bounced <laughs> off the side window. Where the hell are we? He said, straightening up in his seat. Dust rolled past and roiled in the headlights as the truck stopped short of a dilapidated wooden gate in what could barely be described as a road. Yancey flicked on the LED lights instantly burning through the lingering dust to reveal a tattered plywood sign on the gate with the words, Hug a Pig Hunting Lodge, painted in red and with the D conspicuously missing from lodge. More concerning was the smaller sign that read, Enter at your own risk. Skeeter and Yancey shared a glance. I'm driving, Yancey stated the obvious. Skeeter huffed, knowing he had no argument, then went and opened the gate. It was another three miles of deeply rutted road that cut through the Appalachian Valley. The heavily foliaged cottonwood, walnut, and poplar trees cast a canopy over the trail, blocking out all but glimpses of the stars and crescent moon. Yancey felt a sense of claustrophobia setting in when mercifully the trees thinned to reveal a lush open valley, closed in on both sides by steep rolling mountains. A light flickered further down the trail, 
and after a few more minutes of being bounced around like the right and left nuts on a champion rodeo bull, Skeeter and Yancey found themselves staring at the frontier-style cabin. No fucking way, Skeeter said. Near, 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 near. Yancey warbled to the tune of dueling banjos. Calling the building the cabin was generous. Most people would probably describe it as more of a shack. The porch roof sagged a good foot in the middle. Tin siding and plywood covered the holes in the roof and walls. And it looked like it was one strong gust of wind away from being kindling. A good-sized barn stood back and off to the south side of the shack leaning against its timbers. And some run-down corrals stood unused to the north. Skeeter was just about to start discussing travel plans when an old man stepped out onto the porch. There's the welcoming committee, Yancey said. The two stared at each other unblinking, hoping the other would lead the way. Yancey finally wavered. Not wanting to keep the old man waiting, he stepped down from the truck. How you doing? He asked, walking up to the rickety porch. Who are you? He got for his trouble. The old man scowled at him more out of one eye than the other. We're looking for the hugger. You found it. The old man interrupted, turning to go back inside. Well, that's a good one, Yancey said, pulling the picture he had printed off and pointed at the pristine lodge. Burned down last week, the old man shouted over his shoulder. Don't let the heat out. Yancey turned back to Skeeter and using two fingers made the shape of a gun. Skeeter raised his jacket, revealing the pistol holstered on his belt. The oppressively hot living room was in about the same condition as the outside of the cabin, except instead of plywood and tin covering the holes, animal hides and taxidermied critters covered almost every inch of the walls. There was everything from bobcats and mountain lions to badgers and squirrels. But this asshole's pride and joy had to have been the bald eagle hanging over the mantle. Wings spread, with an arrow sticking out of its chest. The name's Richard, the old man said, sinking into a threadbare recliner. <sighs> Vance Richard. Uh, I'm Yancey, and this is Skeeter. Yancey offered his hand. The old man's gloved hands held firm to the armrests, every second becoming more awkward. Then Skeeter, finally deciding he had seen enough of this shit show, piped up. Look, Vance, you're obviously not set up to guide a hunt here. So me and my amigo are just gonna get back in his truck and get the fuck out of Dodge. That's too bad. <laughs> the old man coughed out a hoarse chuckle. <sighs> you city slickers want a fancy place to stay. Go stay at the... Well, someplace fancy. But if you want the best hunt y'all ever been on, you're in the right place. <laughs> Doing his best Jack Palance impersonation, Yancey asked, Well, what do you think, City Slicker? Skeeter didn't take his eyes off the old man. The old man stared back, his still gaze never wavering. Skeeter held up a finger. One day... If we're not fucking amazed, we're gone. The old man's sardonic smile was a recipe for nightmares. His few remaining teeth looked more like oddly spaced corn nuts in a cavernous abyss. And those goddamned eyes. It was like having a stare down with the devil himself. Skeeter took comfort knowing his pistol was close by, and he had no less than four knives tucked away just in case the need arose to cut something, or someone. Richard led them down a narrow hall and into a room that barely accommodated the two narrow beds with a nightstand in between. <sighs> My nephews will be here in the morning. They like they head out before daylight, so y'all best be hitting the fart sack. <laughs> Yancey and Skeeter had barely had time to slip their boots off when a low hum that had been barely noticeable became a sputtering prattle, followed by silence. The bare bulb that hung by its cord from the ceiling faded to a glowing wire, and then the room went dark.
Before sunrise the next morning, the bedroom door burst open, and two of the roughest-looking hillbillies God ever turned loose on the earth stormed in, and were just about to start raising a ruckus when the first one in realized he was staring down the barrel of a very large pistol, and behind the pistol was a very pissed-off redneck. The second man in, now grasping the situation, smiled dimly. Let me guess. Skeeter drew a bead on the man standing closest. Jethro? Then he took aim at the second man. And Ellie May? The hillbilly stared blankly, dismayed by the reference. Jethro spoke up, eyes still fixed on the gun. Uncle Vance says we can go up and shoot a couple of hogs and bring them back to you. If it you need your beauty sleep. The brothers' dim, tentative grins revealed about nine tobacco-stained teeth between the two of them. Tell Uncle Vance he can... Tell Vance we'll be there in a minute, Yancey said. That is what you were going to say, right? I was going to ask if either of these rocket surgeons have ever heard of a toothbrush. Skeeter and Yancey followed a sweet, savory aroma to the kitchen, where Vance and his nephew sat scarfing down a mishmash of pig parts like a pack of starving wolves. Vance wiped the grease from his chin onto his gloved hand, and Yancey was suddenly glad they hadn't shaken hands. <sighs> that's Doug, and that's Maynard, Vance pointed. Doug and Maynard kept packing meat into their sass holes like they were terrified they wouldn't get their share. We've already met, Skeeter said, tapping the bulge in his jacket. Just like a passel of possums in a gunny sack, Yancey smirked. Without the offer of breakfast, not that they would have accepted, they headed out the door. Maynard ran across the porch, but when he got to the edge and was about to leap to the ground, Doug shoved him hard, sending the burly man-child to land on his head and shoulder. He rolled belly up and caught Doug's ankle as he tried to run past and dragged him to the ground. Yancey, Skeeter, and Vance watched him from the porch as the two heathens punched, gouged, kicked, and bit each other like they were acting out a scene from the Atfield and McCoys. These two always fight like this, Yancey asked. Shit, Vance grumbled. This is barely an argument. He strode over and grabbed his nephews by their matted hair and drug them still kicking and squalling to an SUV that was parked in front of Yancey's truck. I'm driving, one of them hollered. Bullshit, it's my turn. The old man held them apart while they continued kicking and spitting at each other. When a stray gob of spit went in his good eye, the old man's patience vanished. He brought the two together head first for a little family bonding. Ah! And both of them fell to the ground, cradling their dented skulls. Not relishing the idea of being stuck in an enclosed cab with the inbred version of the Three Stooges, Skeeter told Vance they'd follow them in their own vehicle. For whatever reason, this seemed to incense the old man and he took out his anger on the still-dazed nephews, mercilessly backhanding them both until blood ran freely from their battered faces. Then, just as quickly as the beating had begun, it was over. Maynard climbed behind the wheel. Vance took shotgun, and Doug bailed in the back seat. Earlier, Skeeter had compared these heathens to a pack of wolves, but now he decided that was a huge insult to the wolves. Yancey caught up to the SUV that flew over more bumps than it hit. Have you noticed anything suspicious about our hosts? Yancey, working hard to keep the truck on the trail, laughed sarcastically. <laughs> you mean, like not having a hunting lodge? Not offering us any meals? Skeet said. Looking like they haven't bathed in the coon's age, and yet being dressed in top-of-the-line hunting clothes? Yancey added. That SUV was beat to shit, but it couldn't have been more than a few years old. And no license plates front or back, Skeeter said. You saw how pissed off Vance got when you said we'd take our truck. So what do you think? Shall we make a run for it? Skeeter pondered the idea. No, these guys have probably got shortcuts all over these mountains. About all we can do is keep an eye on them. Yancey reached under his seat and pulled the 44 Magnum he kept stashed for emergencies. <laughs> it's subtle, <laughs> Skeet laughed. 
The valley ended at a thick tree line, and Skeeter felt that familiar closing-in feeling again. Thick brush scraped along the sides of the truck and branches snapped as the big 4x4 crawled forward. They caught up to the SUV where their guides had parked in a small clearing and were pulling their rifles out of the back. Yancey eased up behind them and put the truck in park. Hunting for wild boars seemed about as important as picking daisies at this point, but he didn't want to raise suspicions. So he climbed down out of the cab and slipped on an orange hunting vest, hoping the hillbilly halfwits wouldn't mistake it for a target. Skeeter pulled the strap of his rifle over his shoulder and followed the wristers to a ridge that looked down on a clearing with no less than a dozen hogs milling around a pile of corn. Suddenly, shots filled the air as a wave of lead zinged past Skeeter's head. After gulping down his heart, he realized he wasn't the target, but damn these assholes could use a hunter's safety course. Doug and Maynard ran to inspect the carnage as if they had done something to be proud of. What the hell was that all about? Skeeter asked. Every bit of that meat is ruined. Vance, reloading his rifle, didn't bother looking at him but in answer to his question, pointed at his nose. We're getting the scent in the air. Just what are you trying to bring in? You're obviously not hunting hogs here. Now Vance leveled his gaze at him. Maybe you ain't your average city slicker. He turned his head to spit, then wiped the residual sludge from his chin. You'll find out soon enough. Doug was busy strewing chunks of their fresh kill into low-hanging poplar branches while Maynard drug a carcass up a narrow game trail, leaving a swath of warm blood behind for man and beast to see and smell. Uh, where's your friend? the old man asked. He's probably off somewhere taking a piss, Skeeter said. Uh, he should stay close from now on. Now that the clearing smelled like a butcher's shop, Vance set his nephews to bringing in firewood. Maynard and Doug took turns chopping and splitting all afternoon until there was at least a cord of wood neatly stacked and a fire blazing in the center of the clearing. Then the nephews brought in and piled armload after armload of green leaves that they stacked alongside the firewood. When Vance was satisfied they had brought enough leaves, they began throwing them on the fire, sending billowing white smoke into the air. One by one, they stood in the smoke, turning and rubbing it into their clothes, all for some reason unknown to Skeeter. It was getting late when Yancey finally strolled into camp. Staying warm, he asked Skeeter, even though the evening was still comfortably warm without the fire. Apparently, we're sending smoke signals to someone in the next county, Skeeter chuckled. Vance, sitting on a stump on the opposite side of the fire, snorted. <laughs> Shitty slickers. He sharpened the double-headed axe that had been used to chop the wood, occasionally testing the sharpness of the blades by drawing each edge up his forearm and counting the hairs on the blade. Finally satisfied with the axe's razor-sharp edges, he stood and sank one of the blades into the stump he had been sitting on. He gave a loud, high-pitched whistle that brought Doug and Maynard running. Mm, no more lily dicking today. Uh, these boys are getting Nancy. Skeeter and Yancey got to their feet. Let's go find y'all some big boars, Vance said. His <laughs> nephews hooted and ran for the SUV. Skeeter and Yancey followed the SUV up mountains, across valleys, through ravines, mile after mile of goat trails, and sometimes no discernible trails at all. At the edge of a cliff where there was no place left to go but down, the nephews clambered out and for once, being quiet, got on their bellies before approaching the edge of the cliff. Skeeter and Yancey did likewise. Yancey pulled up his rifle and scanned the valley below. There were two separate groups of boars eating piles of corn that had been recently left out. One boar in particular towered over the rest. The predominant tusks rising out of its lower jaw had to be as big as an adult human hand. Yancey slowly pulled the bolt back and fed a shell into the chamber before refocusing on the trophy boar. A slender branch slipped under and began raising his barrel. Annoyed, he looked over his shoulder. The old man tapped a gloved finger to his lip. Then he said in a hushed voice, <sighs> What about your buddy? 
Yancey looked at Skeeter, who was still surveying the hogs. If we get here early tomorrow, there'll be three biggins. If you shoot that one now, there won't be a hog within fifteen mile of here for a month. Yancey drew up the boar in his scope again and watched it dominate the smaller hogs. He pictured that massive head mounted above his mantle. It wasn't until the valley was completely swallowed by shadows that the group backed away from the ledge. Well, is it worth one more day? Vance asked, already knowing the answer. Yeah, Skeeter said. We'll get what we came for, and then you'll see the back of us. It had been dark for several hours when the trucks pulled up to the cabin. We'll roll out at five. We'll be ready, Skeeter retorted in the same hostile tone. And that was that. No good night, no sweet dreams, no fuck you, even though that's what Skeeter wanted to tell the old bastard more than anything. And he knew the feeling was mutual. Skeeter set the alarm on his phone, and Yancey started setting his own alarm. I already set my alarm, Skeeter said. I'm setting mine for 2 a.m., Yancey said. Why so early? I'm going to have a little look around, Yancey whispered. Sounds risky. You want me to come with? No, you can cover me from here. If you see any hillbillies, do that whippoorwill call of yours. It seemed like Yancey had barely closed his eyes when his phone started vibrating. Both men sat up. I couldn't sleep, Skeeter whispered. You remember the signal? Yell shit and run like hell? Of course I remember the signal. Yancey pulled on his boots, then slipped out the window. He crouched down and ran to the barn door. It had a simple drop-down latch with no lock. Maybe these pricks don't have anything to hide after all, he thought. He pulled the door open just enough to slip inside and close it behind them. The barn was pitch black. As bad as Yancey hated to, he slid up the icons on his phone and thumbed the flashlight. He covered the light with the palm of his hand and gradually released just enough light to illuminate a few feet in front of him. And what he saw made no sense. A late model pickup sat covered in dust, appearing to be in pristine condition. It couldn't have been more than five years old. Yancey pointed the arrow beam of light on the silver and blue license plate and read Missouri 19. He skirted the truck and found a Jeep decked out with 4x4 accessories. It had an Oklahoma license plate. Two other off-roaders were parked behind the first two, with license plates from Arkansas and Illinois. Yancey figured the batteries must be dead, judging from the thick layers of dust they'd collected. But he didn't dare open the door and have an alarm go off. He'd seen enough. At the very least, these boys were car thieves, although he had a sneaking suspicion there was a lot more to the story than just a few stolen trucks. He slipped out of the barn and back through the bedroom window, unseen and unheard as far as he could tell. Well, anything? Skeeter asked. Yancey told him about the collection of vehicles. Skeeter shook his head. Let's try to keep that tank of yours out of their collection. They got a few hours of restless sleep, then got up to Skeeter's alarm. Last day, Skeeter said. Thank God they agreed. Again, Vance insisted that they all take one vehicle, and again, Yancey climbed behind the wheel of his own truck. He slid the key into the ignition and gave it a twist, but the engine didn't respond. He tried again, but something was wrong. He pulled the hood release and Skeeter raised the hood and was about to start investigating when Doug started honking the SUV's horn. Vance walked over to Skeeter and said in his least corrosive tone, If we don't get up to the cliffs early, you boys won't get your boars today. Things were beginning to seem more than a little suspicious, like maybe Richards had played this game before. Skeeter thought to himself, if I were a brain-dead hillbilly, how would I disable a vehicle? He laid on his back and slid under the truck. The Richards went silent. Here's your problem, Skeeter said, raising his voice for everyone to hear. The battery cable to the starter is broke. Of course it had been cut cleanly, but he and Yancey were outnumbered, so he chose his words very carefully. Pass me some tape. 
Yancey dug through the toolbox and found a roll of electrical tape, and with a half-ass splice in the cable, the truck was running like a top. Vance made a piss-poor attempt to conceal his fury. Stay close, city slickers, he growled. If you get lost, you're on your own. He climbed into the back seat of the SUV. Stick a stick in your ass and light it on fire, Doug hollered, adding a hog call. The SUV shot rooster tails and disappeared in a cloud of dust. Yancey stuck a stick in his ass and lit it on fire, assuming that meant haul ass. His truck shot rooster tails of its own and the race was on. Between bouncing off the ceiling, the dash, and the side windows, Yancey told Skeeter one more piece of good news. The day before, when he slipped off on his own, he found a deadfall right in the middle of a game trail covered with branches and leaves. He had almost fallen into it, which wouldn't have made for a happy ending since there were sharpened stakes pointing up from the bottom. He had found a few boulders and laid them across the path to mark the deadly trap. You know they're gonna try to kill us, right? But why haven't they tried already? Well, they've had plenty of chances. Both men considered. Well, don't let them get the drop on you, Skeet said pensively. Battery cables don't cut themselves. The SUV blew past their campsite from the day before and continued careening up the trail. When the ledge came into sight, Yancey switched off the headlights and stopped short. Armed to the teeth, they walked up to the ledge where Vance and his nephews were waiting, all three of them holding rifles and eyeing Skeeter and Yancey like meat that had gone bad. There they are, Vance said, pointing his rifle to the valley below. Take your pick. Yancey looked over the situation. If they went to the cliff's edge, that would leave the hillbillies behind them. Thinking fast, he pulled his pistol and chambered around. Flipping the safety to the firing position, he smiled. Well, you fellas might not know this, but my pal Skeeter here is the three-time Kentucky shark shooting champion. Skeeter raised an eyebrow. Hell, he even won a gold medal in the Olympics for shark shooting. It sounded like a complete load of bullshit, but that didn't matter. He wasn't going to play nice and end up with a bullet in his back. Skeet, he said, getting a firm grip on the pistol. Why don't you shoot the two biggest boars down there? Vance started to protest, but Yancey cut him off. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Remember, three-time state champ, Olympic gold medal. <laughs> two shots ring out in rapid succession, and Skeeter turned to face the Richards. How much do we owe you? he asked. Now it was the shrewd old devil's turn to think fast. Uh, well, I haven't had a chance to figure it up yet. You boys go get your hogs. Meet us up at the campsite. I'll have your bill all made out. Before Skeeter could tell him to go fuck himself, Vance turned. Maynard, Doug, get in the truck. Obediently, they ran to the SUV and left. What in the hell we gonna do now? Yancey asked. Skeeter jacked the spent shell out of his rifle. I guess first thing we ought to do is go get those hogs. Yancey watched the cliff and hillside while Skeeter bled out the massive hog and gutted it. Then Skeeter kept watch while Yancey took care of his hog. It took both men to wrestle the enormous hogs into the bed of the truck, so they made quick work of it. After rinsing their hands and knives, they climbed into the truck. Yancey turned the truck around and headed for the camp. I've heard about all this cat and mouse game I can stand, he said. So we pay our fine host, hug it out, and leave. But I'm keeping my pistol pointed at Vance every second. I'll cover the other two, Yancey agreed. It sounded like the perfect plan. When they got to the campsite, a bonfire was blazing and the white smoke billowed high over the trees. Vance sat on the stump writing in a notebook, but there was no sign of either nephew. Shit, Yancey said. They hadn't planned for this. I guess if we keep our guns on Vance, those two assholes won't dare try anything. This was more of a question than a statement. Well, if there's one thing these hillbillies ain't, it's predictable. Skeeter and Yancey bailed out, guns drawn, pointed straight at Vance's head. What's all this? Vance asked. This game of yours is getting old. 
Just tell me how much we owe you, and we can end this, Yancey said. <laughs> Vance began to laugh like the devil had just whispered the one about the rabbi, the priest, and the prostitute in his ear. Then his smile turned into a hateful sneer. <laughs> Show yourselves, boys, he yelled, and Doug and Maynard stepped out from behind the trees. The problem was immediately apparent. They stood a good 40 yards away from each other, Maynard aiming his rifle at Skeeter and Doug covering Yancey. <laughs> Looks like we've got a standoff, ladies, Vance growled. Drop those rifles, or Uncle Vance gets one right between the eyes, Skeet hollered. You ever kill anybody? Skeeter straightened his arm, closed one eye, and looked down the sights at Vance's forehead. Nope, you're going to be my first. <laughs> Vance laughed that evil maniacal laugh again, and then in a voice cold enough to freeze most men's blood, he said, I'm going to count to three. If them guns ain't on the ground, my nephews are gonna drop you like you. He thought for a moment. They're gonna blow your asses away. One, Vance shouted. Two. Yancey watched Skeeter ready to follow his lead. Then Skeeter dropped his pistol. Damn, Yancey said and dropped his pistol to the side of Skeeter's. Doug and Maynard came a running. Doug gathered up the guns, handed one to his uncle, then took the other one down the front of his pants. Set the safety on that thing for you blow your damn dick off. Oh yeah, Doug said, fumbling to get the gun out of his pants. Jesus Christ, I swear if your daddy was alive, he'd stuff you in a gunny sack and beat you soft, boy. Doug ducked his head at some painful recollection. Get a rope and tie up our bait. Doug got a long length of red and black cotton rope out of the back of the SUV, most likely one of their previous victims' climbing ropes, and tied Skeeter and Yancey back to back. Vance inspected the knots, then ran his filthy gloved hand over Doug's matted hair. Yeah, good job. <laughs> Doug giggled like an innocent child, then ran to do his next chore. What the hell are you doing this for? Yancey asked. You called us bait, but you've got hog meat hanging in every tree and blood covering the trails. If you're trying to bring in a bobcat or mountain lion, you don't need us. The old man sat down on a stump and sorted through a pile of branches, finding a straight one that was the right length and thickness. Then he used Skeeter's bowie knife to sharpen one end. Oh, that's a good knife, he said. We know about all the other hunters you sick fuckers brought up here and killed, Yancey said, knowing full well if he pushed the old man too far, that bowie knife might be at his throat. I've seen the trucks in the barn. All I want to know is why. Vance stopped whittling and seemed to be considering whether or not to waste his breath telling a couple of mamby-pamby city slickers what they were about to die for. He hawked up a glob of spit and launched it onto the toe of Yancey's boot, then went back to whittling. When all the best branches were sharpened, Vance yelled at Maynard to come take them, presumably to line the bottom of another deadfall. Having nothing better to do, Vance said to his captive audience, So you want to know what's going on around here, huh? Uh, well, let me tell you, I ain't hunting no bobcat, or puma, or fucking wild boar. Uh, I'm hunting something more deadly than anything else in these mountains. If he was pausing for effect, it was working. What? Yancey finally asked. Uh, I'm a hunting a hog cat. <laughs> Did you say hog cat? Doing his best to suppress a hysterical fit. Go ahead, laugh it up, Packer Neck. The old man stood and stepped closer to the bait. He slipped off his gloves and held his hands close to Skeeter's face, then Yancey's. Take a look. The middle finger, ring finger, and pinky were missing from his right hand, and the pointer finger, thumb, and a good portion of hand was missing from his left hand. 
boxcars, Chris crossed his hands and ran up his arms. Yancey let out a low whistle. Those look like some nasty hog bites. Vance put his gloves back on his mangled hands, making sure his few remaining digits went in the right holes. Then he swung his hand high in the air and brought down a vicious slap across Yancey's ear. The blow sent an explosion of stars through his brain. Another slap to the back of his head caught Skeeter off guard. He struggled against his bonds, wanting more than anything to get his hands across the old man's throat. Vance raised his hand again, and Skeeter braced himself. Vance lowered his hand and chuckled. <laughs> you ain't got long to live anyway. He went back to his stump and sat down. Since the hog cat got a taste of me, I ain't been able to chum it in with anything but human flesh. He continued like he was telling the story to his grandkids. God forbid there was such hell spawn on Earth. So where is this hog cat? Skeeter asked. Is it invisible? Like the wee leprechauns? Vance stood again, only this time he took up a thick branch and swung it like a bat, snapping it across the bridge of Skeeter's nose. Skeeter blew his nose and a stream of warm blood ran down his face. <sighs> nice one, he said, further enraging the old man. Vance went back to the stump and worked the knife up and down until the stump released its grip, then turned back to Skeeter. Skeeter flashed a red, frothing smile and asked, Hey, Vance, can I tell you something? Vance gnashed his teeth with all the rage of a man driven to insanity. If that imaginary hog cat of yours doesn't kill you, I will. Skeeter spat. Uncle Vance, Maynard said, stepping between him and Skeeter. Talk about divine intervention. Listen, Uncle Vance. A few seconds passed. And then, from what must have been a half mile away, the most bizarre sounding re, for lack of a better word, echoed through the canyon. Vance pushed his nephew aside and closed on Skeeter. He held the long blade to Skeeter's throat and growled, Lucky for you, he only goes after live bait. Come on, boys, it'll be dark soon. With that, he turned and they ran for the cover of the trees. The light faded quickly. Skeeter, you still alive? Yeah, I'm still here. Yancey squirmed a little and then snapped open a lockback knife. Where the hell were you hiding that? Never mind. Just make sure you wash your hands after you touch it. Skeeter laughed, but then had to wonder. The tension on the rope released. Yancey started to stand, but Skeeter stopped him, saying, We've got to wait for nightfall. The dark is the only protection we've got. A much louder re, immediately followed by a roar, reverberated from all directions. Okay, forget what I just said. Make a break for the truck in three, two, one, go! They clambered to their feet, and even though their legs were stiff from sitting on the hard ground all day, made a pretty quick dash for the truck, Skeeter still untangling himself from the rope. Sudden loud pops came from the truck as holes appeared in the door. Yancey dove to the right and found cover in some tall brush, while Skeeter darted to the left and ran a good 20 yards before dropping down into a drawer. Maynard, under orders from his uncle, ran out of the trees and passed the campfire. There was no place for Yancey to go without being exposed, and seconds later, Maynard stood over him, panting and wiping snot on his sleeve. I got him, Uncle Vance! He shouted, looking back to the trees. Yancey bolted toward him, knocking the rifle out of his hands and delivering what should have been a knockout blow to the hillbilly's jaw. Maynard backed away and smiled with gruesome delight as he released a snap on a scabbard and slowly produced a long, a very long survival knife. Yancey fumbled in his back pocket and fished out the lockback knife. 
He folded open the four-inch blade and Maynard laughed dimly, much like Goliath must have laughed at David when he saw David's pathetic little sling. Maynard swung a lightning quick arc that Yancey barely had time to duck out of the way of. Yancey sidestepped, causing Maynard to circle and close the distance again before swinging another haymaker that Yancey backed away from. Again, Yancey sidestepped, and again Maynard circled. Now he was in position. Yancey leaned forward, offering Maynard an easy target. Maynard grinned naively as though his underdeveloped mind couldn't conceive the concept of life and death. He swung the heavy blade with everything he had. Almost too late, Yancey ducked, feeling the blade give his blonde flat top a trim. This was his one chance. He lunged, driving a shoulder into Maynard's midsection. Then he stood to his full height, raising his burden over his head. He took two quick steps forward, and Pyle drove Maynard down. Ribs and backbone cracked, and a final gurgling breath escaped as Maynard's body relaxed over the axe head that had been lodged in a stump. You son of a bitch! Yancey turned just in time to see the butt of a rifle, then Tweety Birds, then the ground. He had never been knocked out before, he thought, and now twice in one day. Lucky me. As the cobwebs cleared, he raised his head and focused on the rifle barrel that was pointed between his eyes. <sighs> you killed my nephew, you son of a bitch! The old man's voice trembled. I'm gonna blow you. Right about then, a low rumble froze the old man. The rifle began to shake. Then, in a panic, he took his aim off Yancey and pointed it in the direction of the ever-intensifying reverberation. The sound became more of a drum roll. Kind of like when someone taps all of their fingers on a wooden table as fast as they can. Vance fired into the darkness. The drumming suddenly stopped. Not because Vance had gotten off a lucky shot, but because the mystery beast had leapt. Vance's eyes expanded to reflect the sheer terror that enveloped his soul. The beast lowered its head and with a sickening thud collided with the old man collapsing his chest and sending his broken body flailing in mid-air a good ten feet before rolling over several times and coming to rest face down in a bed of leaves. Yancey only stood for an instant before a sharp pain in his side dropped him to his knees. Instinctively putting his hand on his side, he felt warm liquid flow over his fingers. Maynard must have slashed me before I body slammed him, Yancey thought. Skeeter had been following a ravine, knowing it wound around and eventually intersected the gang trail. Along the way, he found a three-foot branch that wouldn't take much whittling to make a Louisville slugger. He tried to maintain a balance between moving fast and staying quiet, and before too long, he spotted a rifle barrel pointed in the direction of the campsite from behind the tree. Whoever was holding the gun was hidden from sight, but Skeeter knew it had to be one of the wristers. Doing his best cat impression, he raised the makeshift bat over his head and tiptoed forward. He brought the branch down on the barrel of the gun, driving it into the ground, then raised the branch over his shoulder as he stepped around the tree. Doug stood, shaking the sting out of his hands, and Skeeter swung for the fence, catching Doug on the shoulder and sending him stumbling. Skeeter dropped the branch and picked up the rifle, seeing an image of tying Doug to the tree at gunpoint. Raising the rifle, Skeeter felt the weight shift and the butt twist in his hand as the barrel came away from the stock and fell to the forest floor. He was about to make a comment about his luck in general when he heard a bowie knife that had recently belonged to him being drawn from its sheath. He retreated to the trail and hoofed it. Doug ran after, making up ground with every step. Skeeter kept a keen eye as Doug advanced. Suddenly, Skeeter spotted the boulders on the trail and dropped, rolling into a ball. He braced as a foot caught him in the ribs. Doug flipped over the heap that was Skeeter, broke through the branches, and plummeted into the deadfall. After the dust and debris had settled, an eerie silence ensued, as though the mountains, the forest, and all the living things within breathed a collective sigh of relief at being rid of an unholy blight. 
Skeeter, holding his ribs with one hand, crawled to the edge of the pit and looked over the precipice. After a few seconds, his eyes adjusted to the near pitch black of the pit, and he was able to make out the form of the young man who had just tried to kill him, with at least a dozen stakes protruding up through his lifeless body. He looked kind of like he had lost a fight with a porcupine. Skeeter quelled the thought. Even after meeting such a violent end, his expression seemed peaceful. Skeeter felt no animosity toward either of the Richard's nephews. In fact, he wondered if he would have turned out any better with an uncle like... It was then that Skeeter remembered Vance and Maynard, and where the hell was Yancey? Well, Yancey was still alive, but his side hurt worse than the time Skeet had told him the one about the rabbi, the priest, and the prostitute. He stared, open-mouthed, at what could only be described as a hog cat. Son of a bitch. The old bastard wasn't lying. By the dying campfire's glow, Yancey could make out a set of tusks, or they might have been teeth, like those of a saber-toothed tiger. The snout was flat like a hog's, but short and split between the nostrils. The massive head and raised hump were pure hog, and probably its most cat-like feature were the massive claws that protruded and retracted into wide padded paws. The final observation Yancey made was that a thick coat of rusty brown fur covered the creature's neck and shoulders, then receded into sparse wiry hairs about its stomach and rump. Yancey's wound sent a sudden twinge up his side, and he gingerly peeled away his dried-on palm, allowing a fresh stream of blood to run down his side. Too late, he realized this was like waving a rare Yancey steak under the hog cat's snout or nose. Under the hog cat's snows, he decided. The unnatural beast lowered its head at Yancey and sank its claws into the ground when a high-pitched whistle startled the beast. And it spun around on all fours to find the source of the sound. Standing on the game trail about 30 yards away, Skeeter twirled the figure eight of a climbing rope. The hog cat watched confusedly following the travel of the rope. Then Skeeter, being Skeeter, did something only Skeeter would do. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. The hog cat pawed the ground, then crouched. Oh, shit. Skeeter turned and darted down the trail towards the wash. The hog cat bounded after its new prey, closing considerable distance with every stride. Yancey ran to Vance's prone corpse and bent down to pick up the rifle. His intention was to run after the hog cat, but on standing up and taking a few wavering steps, the forest began spinning like the tassels on a stripper's melon patch. The ground came up to nestle his cheek, and the Tweety Birds went into their song and dance routine again. A black oak tree rose out of the ground alongside the path, and this is where Skeeter decided to make his stand. He dug in his heels and turned to face the charging behemoth. Skeeter shook out what he considered to be a sufficient-sized loop and began twirling it in front of him. He judged the speed of the beast, and as it leapt, he stepped aside, leaving the rope suspended in midair by the inertial rotation of the loop. Or whatever explanation sizzles your sausage. When the hog cat blurred past, Skeeter prayed to his maker for a little more divine intervention and yanked on the rope. The loop closed around the beast's rib cage. Skeeter let the slack slide through his hand so as not to get drug off his feet. Then, clamping the last foot of the rope between his teeth, he bounded up the tree, finding just enough notches in the bark to climb. He could hear the hog cat leaping and clawing at the tree beneath him. He scurried up the last few feet before reaching the branch that hung over the path. Checking his grip and footholds, he eased out onto the branch. The hog cat backed away from the tree and paced back and forth under him, grunting and snarling as if to say, stop wasting time and get in my belly. When Skeeter had slid himself out far enough away from the tree that he knew the hog cat couldn't reach it, he threw the slack end of the rope over the branch, took a wrap around his hand, and dropped. As soon as the rope took weight, the hog cat flew into a rage, twisting and writhing like a river trout fighting a taut fishing line. Skeeter's downward slide stopped only a foot under the branch, and his heart sank as the unforeseen snag in his plan became apparent. The hog cat was heavier than he was. 
Seemingly out of nowhere, plan B popped into his head. Now, Skeeter wasn't much of an acrobat, but needs must when the devil drives, and this hell-blown monstrosity was driving Skeeter to desperate measures. He swung himself upside down and propped his feet against the underside of the branch. Then, summoning all of his strength, he straightened his body. He groaned, realizing just how heavy the thing was, but needs drive and all that. He took another handhold close to the branch and pulled again. He was sure the beast was no longer standing on the path, but he gave the rope one more heave just to make sure. Then, holding the taut rope in one hand, he pulled up the slack from below and pulled through a half hitch and another, and another just to be on the safe side. With his head swimming and the last of his strength waning, he swung away from the wildly thrashing hog cat and kicked away from the branch. His plan was to flip right side up, land on his feet, and roll to absorb the impact, and he almost pulled it off. The only problem was without being able to see the ground in the dark, he over-rotated. Landing on his heels, his tough and roll became an earth-shaking wallop as he bounced on the hard-packed game trail. He rolled to his knees and tried to inhale, but nothing happened. He tried again to pull air into his lungs, and again his lungs refused to work. Skeeter knew from his early experience of being thrown off bulls that if he passed out, he'd probably start breathing again automatically. The only problem was the thrashing hybrid hanging from a rope ten feet away, and how long could that rope hold it? He tried again. With consciousness slipping away, a slight wheezing breath filled his lungs. He gasped and coughed as the expansion of his chest cavity sent spasms of pain through his body. As bad as the pain was, he needed air to clear his head. Yancey. His best friend's name overwhelmed all other thoughts. Skeeter stood, sending out a guttural growl so primal, even the hog cat stopped its wailing protest. Skeeter breathed quick, shallow breaths that matched his pace running back up the trail. Oh, shit! Was all he could say when he reached Yancey's unmoving body. He knelt and rolled him onto his back. A weak groan emanated from his friend, sending a thrill of hope to combat the overwhelming dread at seeing the glistening knife wound in his side. Skeeter pulled off his favorite western shirt, then his sweat-drenched t-shirt. He pressed a t-shirt against the wound, bringing forth another groan. <laughs> Sorry, pal, Skeet said. The fun's not over yet. Repositioning himself, he placed his hands under Yancey's shoulders and raised them to a sitting position. Yancey's body shook as Skeeter wrapped his overshirt around Yancey's torso. All done, he said, lowering his old pal to the bed of leaves again. He went back to Yancey's side and tied a snug square knot in the sleeve of his shirt. I'll be all right, he said assuringly. He ran to fetch the truck and just as promised was back in two shakes of a lamb's tail. He ran around the truck, opened the passenger's door, and reclined the seat. This might suck a little bit, he said, not knowing for sure if his words were registering. He slid his arms under Yancey's legs and back with another one of those guttural growls that seemed to give him a boost of strength. He forced himself to his feet, and moments later had Yancey resting on the soft leather seat. He backed out of the campsite and just started down the goat trail when he noticed something approaching quickly in his periphery. Before he even had time to turn his head, the hog cat leapt and impacted the driver's side door with enough force to cave the door panel into the seat, shattering the window and sending a shower of glass over both men. The headlights dimmed as the engine sputtered and died. The savage battering ram shook its enormous head, blew green viscous froth from its nose, and backed away. Come on, damn it, Skeeter said, desperately cranking the ignition switch but no matter how hard he twisted, the engine wouldn't respond. Yancey raised the leg opposite his lacerated side and stomped a heavy boot on the floorboard. I know, buddy. I'm trying, Skeeter said. Yancey raised his leg and stomped again. This time, the dash lights flickered. 
Skeeter gaped at Yancey with astonishment. Barely conscious and bleeding like a stuck pig, Yancey had guessed that the jerry-rigged splice in the battery cable had separated enough to lose current. Yancey raised his leg for a third and probably final attempt. Skeet cranked the ignition as the boot came down. A crackling came from under the hood, accompanied by a white puff of smoke as an arc jumped across the gap and welded just enough strands in the cable to turn the engine over. The Hogcat, meanwhile, had backed far enough away to build up maximum speed, and with its sight locked on the two-legged creature that was too stubborn to be killed and eaten, it pounced. Skeeter threw the truck into drive and stomped on the throttle. The truck launched forward, leaving a black cloud to mingle with the dust. The Hogcat plowed into the back panel of the bed, sending it sailing through the air only to land on all fours. The rear wheels had been forced off the trail. Yancey and Skeeter bucked in their seats as Skeeter refused to take his foot off the throttle. He spun the steering wheel one way and then the other, finally regaining control. Watching the hogcat shrink in the mirror, Skeeter tried to think of an appropriate quote from some action movie. Then he smiled and said, That'll do, pig. A pre-dawn orange and blue hue lit the eastern sky as Yancey's demolished truck pulled up in front of the cabin and sputtered to a halt. Skeeter dug his phone out of the center console and unplugged the charger. Come home, baby, he urged as the screen lit up. Yes, two bars. He dialed 911 and was greeted by the voice of an angel. What is your location in emergency? Yancey passed Skeeter the printout, and Skeeter read off the directions, also explaining that his friend had been stabbed and was losing blood. I'm requesting medevac, he said, remembering the words from some phony Hollywood blockbuster. He held his breath. Air Med will be dispatched from Newport. Skeeter raised his triumphant fist. Now that he had time, he climbed up into the bed of the truck and fished out a few bottles of water from the cooler and the first aid kit from the toolbox. Yancey was barely responsive as Skeeter gave him a few sips of water and redressed the wound. Skeeter went into the cabin and got Yancey's bedroll out of the bedroom. When he stepped off the porch, a distant rumbling sound sent a wave of dread through him. But just before he shifted into survival mode again, the rumble became the familiar chopping sound of helicopter blades. Before Skeeter could say, damn, that was fast, they were loaded into the helicopter and headed for civilization. While they were being held against their will in the hospital, a couple of FBI suits showed up waving badges like they had just won them out of a claw machine. Apparently, some bones had been found and DNA matching was being done. There was a substantial reward for any information about the missing hunters, and after talking it over, Skeeter and Yancey decided the families could probably use the money for funeral expenses and whatnot. Then came the philosophical debate about where the hell a hogcat could have come from. Skeeter explained to Yancey that when a tomcat and a sow pig fall in love, Not one chance in a billion, Yancey said. DNA strands between species don't match. Well, let's hear your theory then, college boy, Skeet blustered. The government must have had a secret lab hidden somewhere in the Appalachian Mountains. The thing was supposed to be a big surprise for the Russians. I vote for outer space, Skeet said. No way that thing was a local boy. And so on. After two weeks, Skeeter was sent home, and a few days later, Yancey got brought home and dumped in a bed under strict orders to stay there for a week. Skeeter stood on the front porch and leaned through the bedroom window. Tannehill, get your ass out of that bed. The blanket stirred and Yancey slid himself up to rest against the headboard. Let's go, city slicker. We got chores to do. <laughs> Yancey gulped down the chuckle when he saw the purple rings around Skeeter's eyes and the plastic nose brace that didn't complement the look. The bedroom door swung open and Yancey's home health care nurse came in carrying a pink pail. Emily Pearson, what in the name of all that's holy are you doing in Yancey's bedroom? Isn't it obvious? She said with a mostly professional smile as she raised a yellow sponge out of the steaming pail of water and wrung it out. 
Emily had been one of the few girls in their class who could have given the homecoming queen a run for her money if she gave a shit about that sort of thing. But Emily was a redneck country girl through and through, and here she was after all these years in Yancey's bedroom, giving him a sponge bath, no less. Lucky bastard! Bolin, she said, still sporting the smile. In about two seconds, you're going to see more of your buddy than you ever wanted to. And she yanked the blanket down. Of course, Yancey, being the gentleman that he was, had on a pair of purple gym shorts with silver racing stripes down the sides. Not that it mattered to Skeeter. He was already halfway across the porch. He held his ribs and eased down on his favorite rocking chair. Then, reaching into the pocket of his second favorite western shirt, pulled out a handful of peas and began shelling them. The peas were in his mouth while the pods were set on the handrail for Lucy Bell to nibble on. Skeeter took in as deep a breath as his ribs would allow that kinda smelled like sheep shit and thought, Life ain't bad. Chilling tales for dark nights.